crotch, bring it back. Single leg swing. Let me teach you how to wrestle. Okay. Let me teach you how to wrestle. All right. the... We have such an awesome treat for the wrestling world with this great mastermind, maybe one of the greatest mastermind sessions of all time, a long form interview. Um, really more of a conversation than an interview. Uh, myself, um, the least of which, of course, with two legends, Coach Jeff Buxton, Coach Ernie Monaco. And I'm Coach Buxton, we all know him, uh, Buxton trained, uh, Blair Academy, uh, Coach Sebastian Rivera, many other great wrestlers throughout the years. Uh, we know Ernie Monaco, the godfather of New Jersey wrestling, the, the um, founder of The Edge, the owner of The Edge, and how you know he worked with, and I was like the first wrestling club I was ever aware of as a little kid. So just awesome free flow conversation it wasn't formal at all it was just two friends i mean the great thing you look at this best friendship between buxton and monaco and how they just talk about wrestling it was just effortless in fact my only regret was that my brother and i didn't get there earlier because we walked in and they were they were already in the office over at the edge having a great conversation talking wrestling so we couldn't keep those cameras rolling enough and from all these teaser clips that we've been putting out there it seems everyone really wants to see this this um unbelievable show we did this great mastermind group where these two absolute legends of the sport and that's they are legends like if, if you don't know these two people you, you must live under a rock or you're not from new jersey and even if you are you aren't from new jersey you probably do live under a rock then if you don't know these guys now i'm not putting anyone down because it's impossible to know every single person but two two unbelievable people like i said a lot of the interesting thing about these two guys is a lot of the people you're watching now either at the NCAAs or NCAA coaches or New Jersey coaches or club owners, they all came from these two people. They are like the wrestling parents of a lot of these club owners and a lot of even these college coaches, these people that you see who are doing great things now. So anytime you get these two people around, you know, you're just, we're just talking about unbelievable topics. I mean, and it's not, and it's not um, day to day stuff. It's not newsworthy things. It's not, oh, what's going to happen this week at the NCAAs or what happened last week at the Big Ten? We spoke a little bit about that. What I like about it is it's evergreen content, evergreen content. The, the leaves always stay green. It was an important interview. It was an important the, – the, the topics were relevant now. They were relevant 30 years ago, and 30 years from now, they'll still be relevant. That's an evergreen topic, and for me personally – that's my favorite kind of stuff. You probably see with Wrestling Mindset, we could probably do a lot better job of, of relaying the news in wrestling, but I'm just not a day-to-day -day thinker. I'm a, I'm a big picture. What's this material that anyone can apply? So sometimes that means the day-to-day -day news is kind of gets swept underneath the rug, and we start going for this evergreen material that we always need to know. Everyone needs to know it all the time, and they will 50 years from now, 100 years from now, it's going to be great information. So, well, the principles, the principles will always ap apply. The parameters might change. Like some of the things we spoke about is how the club scene is, has changed over the years. Team, uh, certain things have changed over the years, but the principles always remain the same. The fundamentals remain the same. So you're going to hear about technique. You're going to hear both Coach Buxton and Coach Monaco talk about the importance of mindset and why we do what we do with wrestling mindset and how that plays into the big picture of everything that's going on. You're going to hear about the dangers of club hopping. You're going to hear about um, the, the difficulties of, of, of not having a systematic plan. They're going to talk about the dangers of focusing on other people and what's going on in different places. And this is something we're looking to do. We're really looking to do this. My goal is to do this several more times. We spoke about this um, after, the, after the night was over. This, this could have easily have gone on hours longer. And that's my whole plan, that we do this several more times because it was just unbelievable fellowship with just two masterminds in the sport of wrestling. Um, we couldn't get enough of it. Right after, right after my brother Jeff and I left, Jeff was behind the camera as I was, as I was sitting talking to these two legends. And, and Jeff and I, we just kept talking about everything that went on. Just, you know, we, we were able to recap the whole night and what happened and just, just blew our mind and everything. So, like I said, these guys have just coach some of the very best in the in the country some of the very best in the world definitely the best in the state and they they understand what it, what what coaches need to do what coaches should be thinking about what they shouldn't be thinking about um and how to better the sport of wrestling and how and and one thing that kept coming up was we think a lot about their successes and that's great they had a ton of successes but they think but they're truly coming from it from the right place i will say that 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 that, that really came through with both Coach Buxton and Coach Monaco, that these guys are really in it for the right reasons. They're trying to develop the wrestler, 
and they're trying, they're looking at wrestling, as we say, as a vehicle to make them better people and how to, and just a, a great love for the sport and a tremendous love for developing persons, which is huge, right? It's not just wrestling. And, and the other thing I noticed, none of this, none of this. It wasn't like, oh yeah, I'm Coach Buxton. What do you know, Coach Monaco? I'm, I'm Coach Monaco. What do you know, Coach Buxton? None of this. It was more, you know, you're excellent. And the other one, no, no, you're excellent. They didn't say those words, but as you watch their body language, watch this interview really carefully and you see how they piggyback off each other. I'm not saying they agree on every single thing, but the respect level is sky high. And I see that a lot of times with with coach, with with uh, club owners, a lot of times more inexperienced people or people who are more like maybe guarded, um, you know, rivalries. I get it. Rivalries emerge. That's what's fun with the sport. There's nothing wrong with rivalries, right? And there is, of course, an element of competition with, with businesses and stuff. But but the respect level, you know, you're excellent. No, no, you're excellent. And that's that's what we got to see. So like I said, unbelievable fellowship. Make sure you watch the full interview. It's going to be great. I mean, it, we were there. We know we're just, we're just cutting it up. We're just cutting up some of the parts. Um, we're not giving you the uncut version because... Obviously, as you'd, as you'd imagine, among best friends, a lot of things are said that aren't really meant for the camera. So we're going to hack it up a little bit so it's more uh, user-friendly uh, for the public. But like I said, the, the, the uncut version, it would, be, it, would, it would even be a lot longer. But um, like I said, between, between best friends, a lot, not everything is going to be um, shared for the camera. But just like I said, awesome, great people, ambassadors for the sport, just tremendous. So make sure... Make sure you check out the video. We're excited for you to see it. Mindset makes the difference. Super 32, yes. right? Like, right. And don't, don't let me talk about Super 32. Right. Doesn't it create some opportunities? <laughs> Doesn't it create some opportunities though for some kids that may, may not be the starters, like at like Adele Barton? Absolutely. And, but um, what what I feel about what that tournament does is about cutting weight, um, and guys are dropping weight classes because it's night before weigh-in. And as me, as a guy trying to train kids, um, two or three weeks prior to that, they're spending all their time in September right. of cutting weight and right. not getting better. Right. So uh, the, the whole emphasis is on cutting weight. And then when they go there, they're gonna wrestle 10 matches and, and they're not in the shape that they need to be in. Right. Um, and, and so- Where you're trying to get in Fargo shape for, a, for a, a, a Fargo status event in the fall preseason when, when when they're, then you're down again, like your, your cycles of training, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You're down, you're up, then you're down, then you're up. Like, you know, so he, he, we try to, cal other coaches try to calculate, I try to calculate when my guys are gonna peak, yeah. when they're gonna be at their best. And their training schedule is laid out so that they're at their best at the end of the year when it's most important. Yeah. When this event falls at a time where, you know, for other reasons as well, like he said about the weight cutting, but it falls at a time where, um, Still, it's, it's still work difficult. needs to be done then. The, to me, the focus needs to be on skills, starting off, and then building your conditioning. And um, for me, it was very different when I was coaching in high school that our first tournament was for a national championship. So I had to get guys ready for that tournament. They had to be in shape for that tournament. They had to have the skill work in, into that tournament. So a lot of our hard training would come in October. And so I mean, through October and November, and, and you know, it, it got to be more wrestling and then backing down. Right. And so then it went from uh, Ironman to uh, Beast of the East and then to Powerade. And the way that I looked at it was, I got plenty of guys on my team. If somebody gets hurt, I bring in another guy. But, um, and it, it gave opportunities for, for other people, but hitting the first one was important. Um, that that usually was, you know, uh, 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 either was St. Ed's or it was uh, uh, the school, Paris Graham, Paris Graham, um, Walsh Jesuit. Walsh Jesuit. Um, you know, we were hitting those Ohio schools, and then, you know, at at the Beast, we we're hitting the Pennsylvania schools, and then I wanted to hit the Western Pennsylvania schools, so that's why I went to the Power Aid because it's all different, you know, styles of wrestling. But to bring guys through three tournaments like that, um, training was, was really important. You know, it's almost what, you know, you're doing tapering guys to get ready for the NCAA tournament or getting ready for the world championships where you're backing off on them when you're, when you're coming down, down to go time. And I would do that 
uh, leading up to the Ironman tournament, uh, where you know the practices were one hour long, in and out, um, as opposed to in October, where you had to spend a lot of time teaching and working technique and, and drilling and all of those things. Getting in shape. Yeah, seeing ready to go, right out of the gate. Yeah. Um, so it was, and you know, like Ernie was saying before, I made some mistakes. Um, I, you know, I, I traveled too much. Um, and, you know, the one thing that I tried to do once I got the ball rolling was to only wrestle once a week. And I don't know how some of these high schools do it three or four times a week. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of times making weight. Yeah. There's no training involved. Um, right. So it's... Um, and mentally, when we're dealing with the guys, now we're just dealing like match to match to match so just like you're working with them technique we're trying to build a skill set here yeah. he's thinking about his weight and winning the next match he's not thinking about hey let's work on this so um that that made things very easy for me and it's almost you know the same that we're doing at Rutgers right now uh the match is on friday sunday so you revolve your training around those two days you have your time day off you have you know so it's all all those things predictability yes um, and um, and, and just, you know, I think the biggest thing is consistency of your training and making, guys, making sure guys are getting better, for sure. Yeah. It's hard. Really hard. Yeah. Oh, but, it, I mean, for me, it's something that I would take notes and um, in preparation for an event and then after, how, you know, how did we do? And I would do the same thing for, for seasons. Um, and you know, having an evaluation period with the guys, what what did you find really good? What was what was helpful for you? What if you had a chance to do something over again? How would you do it? And also talking to guys when they would go to college, um, what did how did I prepare you? And a, a lot of them would say we weren't ready for the running, <laughs> the preseason running. And yeah. I used to spend the time in the room instead of doing yes. the the running. Um, that was one. Uh, but isn't that a good thing overall? Yes. So they weren't ready for the running. They weren't ready for, yeah. They're not in the track team. Um, when I first started coaching, it was top bottom. You know, I can't ride anybody. I can't get off the bottom. So, you know, I started spending a lot more time on, on top bottom. But, you know, just having these things to, to move on and trying to evolve as a coach as you're, as you're going through the years, I think is important. Plus, keeps you fresh. I, I know you feel the same way. Yeah. Um, I think I think you have to like, I think sometimes we do things like, being that we're both older and been at a long time, hmm. I think sometimes you, like we now can look back and reflect on things that we did that worked, things that didn't work, hmm. you know what I mean? And sometimes you're doing things and you're not, um, you have a, now we have a different level of understanding when you look back and say, why this worked, how it makes sense, how it fits with the process, you know? But I think like some of the things like him going to the tournaments, um, I think defining like what the objective is, like why are we here? Why are we going into this event? What's the purpose of being here? What do we what do we hope to get out of it? I don't think those are things that a lot of people don't take the time to think about before they enter. They just do it because everybody is doing it. Yeah. So right. whether it's a whether it's a duels team tournament or whether it's it doesn't matter what the event is. Right, it, the the approach, like what he, he's speaking to, like um, like a developmental approach to it, toward the athlete, where you're you're working on. I need more time in the room. I need less time on them competing, so they have time in the room to work on developing my athletes, developing my skill set, developing whatever. Is is very objective, like oriented. You know what I mean? So he has a plan, yeah. versus like a lot of people, they it, the objective is to compete, and they'll say, well, more matches is better more is better so if we wrestled nine matches in a day or two days and there's a saturation point where more is not better you know again it goes it speaks to what the objective is when do you have enough information that it's time to go back to the laboratory and now work on work on your skill set and, and work on the you know the science what are we doing here we got we got to we got to retool we need to come back we need to adjust we're all doing this wrong we need to make these adjustments and changes so i think like it's hard to strike that balance between um coaching and like the you know trying to satisfy different things because the schedule may that an athletic director or somebody may give you 
warrants this is what it is and if you're not working like so I, I did my own schedule yeah so it makes a big difference makes a real very big difference right. and yeah. you know, the first when i first showed up there here's your schedule and i don't like this <laughs> yeah and so you know and making adjustments and you know he's talking about younger kids um i was working with a kid and he was wrestling in uh two different age divisions and two different styles and he's at this one tournament and you know i i didn't i didn't know that he was doing this i said okay you can wrestle greco and freestyle in this day but i didn't know he was doing two different age divisions and like you know i show up and you know the kids running from one mat to the next mat yeah. that's in in the different age division and you know, I, I said to him why are you doing this and he goes well my dad thought it would be good and I said, well, that's the last time you should probably listen to your dad. Um, because, it, it, you know, it, for the dad, it was, we're going to get more matches. And it's, it's not always uh, the most effective thing because the kid, by the, you know, fourth or fifth match, he's run down. And then he's wrestling two different styles. And he's rest, has to wrestle in two different divisions. And, um, you know, I, I, I said to the dad, I want to see you do this. Um, I said, and you know, I think it's an impossible feat that you you put on your son. You know, you know, he's not wrestling that. <laughs> no kidding. You know, it's like, yeah. Um, Our brother Greg went back when he was he wrestled at one of the petty off season tournaments mm -hmm. of, at the petty school, and it was like he wrestled the guy in freestyle, and then literally he was on deck with the same kid in Greco, mm -hmm. like right after yeah. he lost to the guy in freestyle, and he was like, comes off the mat crying, and we're like. You get to wrestle this kid right now, like you're in the driver's seat, and he came off best, and he wound up winning. But that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But I, I mean, <laughs> um, if you don't know better, though, you don't. Then you do. It's a shotgun well, approach, yes. and it, you ho hopefully something sticks. And and there are a percentage of athletes out there who. I mean, he said he said a good. For. You know, more isn't always better. Um, in you know, in, in some instances, you know, is it more important to get more training than it is to be more more competitions and um yeah. as, as you see overseas um i think our kids at age 10 through 12 are probably better at competing um, but their kids are better athletes um, better technically and um, being able to uh, go through the process for more years um, uh, you know, trying to stay healthy is, you know, one thing. I mean, if you're you're banging like that uh, at those young, younger years so much, and you know, getting over 100 matches a year, and then you know, going into your high school season, and you know, you're doing the same thing three or four times a week, and then in the off season, you're you're going to every ba every tournament that you possibly can to. Your body's gonna. Um, they go a bit different. Like, yes. Overseas. I think here, like in the United States, um, my brother being in sports medicine was telling me the amount of injuries that they're seeing you know, like in sports medicine nice. across the board in all sports mm -hmm. because so many of the youth in America are hitting it so hard mm -hmm. at such an early age that they see injuries in kids that wouldn't norm they wouldn't normally see mm -hmm. until they were in college age and now they're seeing in teenagers, you know, and kids yeah. in high school because everything has been pushed down. And the, the level of competition, you know, has been, the intensity has yeah. been pushed down to a very young age here, you know. And I don't know that I, I necessarily agree with it, but the, you have to adjust and adapt to the environment that we're in to a certain extent. You can't ignore it. Can't ignore it. And, and, and we, you have to kind of work around it as best you can, you know. You know that, that's why it was what, interesting with us being able to pick your brain about this, thinking about this, all of us, where I think we think about it like conceptually. Right, like I said, developing an athlete, which we're in the business too, of course. And we know like it's it's not just enough to have the information, it's putting the information in the proper order. So hammering out the concepts, like we're saying here, and then applying it to the American model. Right. Or where you are. You know, it's a, okay if you're a club owner, right. that's gonna that's that's a, that's very different than a team coach, yes, and it's right. very different than if you're the father. Yes. So we've got to say, okay, well, a lot of fathers, so our assumption is we're the we're the incoming fanatical fathers, right? And it's like what you're thinking is I think most dads who want their kid to do well, they're thinking develop the athlete. Right. But they have these mistaken premises, like you said, more is better than less. Mm -hmm. 
Go to a club where you see that, okay, my kid's seven, that kid's seven, what's he doing? He's gonna follow that kid. He's competing, my kid's competing. Mm -hmm. Like those kind of things. So they're just trying to follow the crowd there. So, and not training minimally, mm -hmm. not training maximally, but training optimally. Yeah. They think more is better than less. Um, it's, it's bad, um, I think, when you get a group of parents together <laughs> yeah. and, and they start comparing notes. Yeah. And so it's almost like I'm trying to top what this guy's doing. And, and, you know, probably more leadership should come from me as a club person of giving them my experience, uh, but that usually doesn't happen. And so, um, and part of it is there's so much club jumping, um, especially in this state and, you know, what people are looking for when they go to a club. Um, it doesn't matter what what age it is. Um, the parent wants to see that kid come out of that room exhausted, and not understanding what uh, really needs to happen in in their development, especially what time of year it is. So there's, um, you know, obviously um, this time of year right now, um, some clubs are switching to to freestyle, some clubs aren't. Um, but to me, this is a period that. Um, you should reflect about you know what just happened at, at the state tournament or at the national preps or uh, what what you did in in um, in your qualifying tournaments, getting ready for the NCAA tournament, and then then afterwards of, of evaluating how that year was, uh, what you did well, what you need to work on, and then set a plan forth and and trying to um, fix the problems, um, just like you're doing with with the mindset. Um, and you know that's a big part of it too. Um, when kids get run down, their mindset is terrible. Um, when when uh, uh, kids are overtraining, uh, it doesn't matter what mindset you have. They're just you know tired and they don't feel like doing it. So it's you know it's being able to do the ups and the downs to have the right training um, and have a, I think kind of a system moving forward what you're doing technically, what you're doing conditioning-wise, how much wrestling that you're doing. Um, and, you know, do kids need to wrestle seven days a week? Um, what, you know, what, what is uh, the value of recovery? Um, and I think kids are starting to learn about that a little bit more. Uh, and they'll bring it up to their parents. Um, uh, I need more recovery. And they're looking at it like, you don't need more recovery. you got to wrestle more. Um, and so it's... You know, them starting to get some knowledge from, uh, I think, the, the older kids, uh, what the senior level guys are doing, um, especially, every, you know, we were talking about um, the ability to have um, video. And when I was growing up, uh, we didn't have any of that. You know, learning wrestling was, you know, what you got in, in your room with your coach. And, and, you know, now there's so many avenues of, of being able to watch wrestling uh, and you know just learn what other countries are doing what other colleges are doing what other high schools are doing I think is a is valuable in, in understanding technique uh, but I don't think that we put enough time in developing kids at a younger level um, and to me that's a little that's a little bit frustrating because <clears throat> and to, to, to be a good student you have to put the time in. You have to educate not only your body, but you got to educate your mind. So, and teaching technique, uh, you know, trying to um, get a younger kid to put their foot in the right position, to put their head in the right, to push, to have their hands locked right. Um, sometimes, to me, so difficult. I don't know how you feel about it, but you know, so I get frustrated sometimes. And let's do it again. Let's do it again. Yeah, I, I think let's for me, again. I think there's a. Um... As I've gotten older, I think part of what I would try to do is not always focus on teaching a skill set. Like you're trying to teach a skill set, but more importantly, I'm trying to teach a process. Mm -hmm. So if I can teach them the process of learning a, a particular skill, they could then apply that process like you guys do. That's basically what you do. You can apply that process to the, the, any skill, you know. So, but they, you find that kids like he, we were talking about before, 
you could spend a half hour trying to teach them how to put a leg in. And if you're not a seasoned you know, coach like he is, somebody younger would real quickly get frustrated, you know? But when, you, when the kids learn of the process of like problem solving, going out and, and how to take something that they visually see here and, and you're showing, and then learn that process of being able to take that way they're being taught it and then mas master that skill and then apply that to other skills. That's something that like most kids don't have. The coaches are running practice and they're, they're, they're just having practice, but the reality is most kids don't know how to practice, right? So like I, last night I, I'm running practice, I'm talking to the kids about, I was talking about Donnie and I was saying about trying to connect their mind to their body when they're drilling and how they should be focused. I asked the question to some kids that were state champions in the room, when they drill, what do they think about, right? And I said, you know, they didn't have an answer, right? And and I, I wasn't trying to put them on the spot or embarrass them in any way. I said, that's normal. That's what I expected them to say. And I said, what do you focus on? They didn't know what they focus on. And so I, I tried to tell them, I said, you know, if you look at a video and you break a video down into a bunch of still shots that are just put together like old black and white film, right? I said, each second of each still shot in that sequence of whatever the technique is you're doing, you should be focused on that particular moment and just being present and what you're supposed to be, where you're supposed to be at that time. Where are your hips, where are your shoulders, where are your hands, where's your head supposed to be? And each sec, each way as you travel through the, the technique, you should be, doing you know, micro-evaluations of where you are. So your focus should be on that moment, that second. And I said, I was trying to explain to them that if you train this way, then when you wrestle, you'll stay present, you'll stay focused on now, and, and you won't get ahead and start worrying about what happened in the past, what's happening in the future, where you are. So you learn how to do these things in the practice room, but most kids feel like they're getting, just because they're moving, they're going somewhere, but they're not necessarily going anywhere. They're not getting better because they go to practice. Kids in New Jersey go to practice, uh, you know, X amount of days a week, and they're putting in a lot of time and energy, but they, in return for their energy output, they may only get this much in return. And part of that is because they don't know how to, like, practice purposefully, you know? So under, like, a watchful eye of somebody like him, somebody like me, who can tell them what to do, and in one hour, their, their gain is going to be tr a lot more because their the level of their focus, their mind is going to be on what they're doing and their return is going to be greater. But the reality is people think that they the same way more is better with competition, they think time is the same thing. Like just we need to practice more. But they don't know how to practice correctly or at a high level. you know. And that's the difference I say to my high school athletes. Like, if you went to the Rutgers room and you're in Rutgers room or any college room in the nation, right? And the most high schoolers are not coming through a, a high school practice that's uh, remotely similar to what's taking place in a college, right? All right. So the, the ability to wrestle through positions, um, I think is, is really big. And being able to move from one situation to the next situation. So the involvement of uh, play wrestling and sparring, I think is crucial for younger kids because they, you know what they what they do is the stronger kid's going to win because they can squeeze through the through the position instead of uh, learning how to flow into a, another position. Um, so to me, that's um, the majority of even with the senior level guys is, is sparring. Um, it seems like that's what Penn State does a lot. Like when I talked to Van Ness when Kale came over to Van Ness's club, mm -hmm. he was like he said that you wouldn't know, but we're not going live. If you walked into the room, you'd think everyone's going live. Yeah, no players. So, I mean, that's, that's the ability to get in positions and to figure out what your body has to do. And, you know, making sure that your shoulder pressure is right, that you're driving in right, to make sure that your head is up, you got the right lock. And then if something happens in that position, where are you gonna move to next? And, you know, that's where I think wrestling really develops. And then, then you have a guy, so I'm gonna use this one guy as an example. His name was Troy Letters. I had him come into practice and, um, I said, when you go in this position, what do you do? I don't know, let me get in there. He, I mean, I was, I was like, what? The field. <laughs> that, was, that was Zeke though, when we would ask him questions, yeah. we'd say, coach, what are you doing in this position? He yeah. said, let me, get, let me get in there and feel it. Yeah, yeah. and so like, yeah. uh, it, you know, that's an incredible <laughs> athlete. Troy was an incredible athlete. He was <coughs> incredibly strong. 
Um, and he had a, an amazing feel. And, you know, you're lucky if you get some of those guys that, um, you know, that you go through a long coaching career, you have those guys that have that amazing feel that- Mizzo would tell you the same thing. Yes, yeah. But he has a system, you know? Yes. I, I mean, he's, he's always doing this and pumping you with his hips, but he doesn't know where he's gonna go. Yeah. Um, but he, when he feels it, he feels it. I mean, it's yes. almost impossible to take down. But the reason that he can do all of that is he does it all the time. Yes. Um, so he's in those positions all the time. Well, I'm going to turn here. I'm going to do this. Um, it would and, seem like an aspirin with scrambling. Yes, absolutely. Or Cal, while we catch your ankles and stuff, and just but, but, has you know, so, on top of your but, but Ben could tell you, if, this ha if I go here, I'm going to do this. If I go right. there, I'm going to do that. Right. He just put himself in different positions right. and then, and you know, he helped develop wrestling in, in a in a positive way, just like Gene Mills did at at, at one point, and, and um, John Smith that did at another point, and Kale did at another point. They're just opening ideas up to to people to to you know improve upon their their knowledge of the sport. What age should they start like floating around play wrestling? Because wouldn't there have to be some understanding of what I got to get my hips up, I got to get my head up. So they just play wrestle. They're so gonna be you got fun. young kids, get here. This is what you have to do. What? Oh, it's, it's, it's the position. Yes, you, you put them in the position, and then you 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 tell them what they have to do, and you make them wrestle that to that position for a long time, and they got to learn to master that one position, and then you say, okay, you're on a single leg, and uh, the guy gets the corner on you. You got to learn how to slip the knee, and you know, and that's a pretty um, high level, I think. Uh, technique, but an easy one to teach and an easy easy one to to, to feel. Um, to me, the harder the harder situations um, is when somebody jumps over the top and then they're they're putting their body in in danger, their ankles, their knees, their hips. And so, in, you know, when I teach scrambling, I'm trying first. My first thing is I'm trying to protect the body. Uh, but you will see um, a lot of these guys with reckless abandon. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is why you're getting so many ACL injuries or um, hamstring injuries is be, because one, they're incredible athletes that, that they're really flexible, but they're putting their bodies in positions that you would say, well, I don't think you should do that. And, you know, the referees are sitting there with the whistle in their mouth. Do I stop that or let this go? And the referees are a whole different issue right now. Well, they'll give a little bit more latitude if they know a guy's good. Yeah, they'll yeah. just still let him do it. Or, they, the or they've seen him wrestle before. Yeah. And they know, you know, they're going to bend this way and they're going to come back this way. They're going to, they're okay. Let it, let the wrestling happen. And sometimes the coaches will talk them through that, uh, and, you know, as they should, because they don't want that position to stop. That kind of also goes to what you were saying before about like I was going for the short term gratification mm -hmm. as opposed to, oh, my body's in danger. And they're like, well, I don't care. I just want to win the wrestling yeah. match. Like, well, maybe that's not the right attitude. Uh, I don't think it is. And, um, but I think, I think to a point like you, you can go forward with the coaching, like you can expose your child to really good coaching and be around good people. But if there's not some type of synergy between the message that you're sending to the child as a coach and and between the parents, the parents always trump the coach. So if if the coach doesn't can't to some extent communicate with the parents, or else the parent or else the athlete has to be away from the parents. So like when he was coaching at, at high school level, then he has the kids captive. They're complete away. control. Right, he has control. Complete, complete. It's a whole different, you're in the army. Yeah. It's a whole different situation. Complete control. But if you're like in my situation or where you're, where they leave the room, they're going back home to mom or dad, right. and um, that parent can undermine and will trump everything that you do. So it, it doesn't matter, like even if he has the best strategy or approach, if he's trying to teach them play wrestling and the parents watching little Johnny wrestle and he's telling the son, how do you lose that kid? score? Yeah, how do you lose to that kid? That kid's yeah. not good at all. He, he's he used up qualified the whole car ride for the kids yeah. a whole car ride home. Yeah. So now you're coming back into practice from the next day and he doesn't want to go through that again on the ride home. So he's trying to pound the, yeah. you know, the heck out of the other boy and you're trying to t tell him, I don't want, I'm not, I want you to do what we're working on, right? I, I want you to work on the skill set. And all he cares about is winning, you know, in, in that situation. And now you have, you're you spinning your wheels. You're not going to get anywhere because unless that parent is on the same page as you with, with, with the messaging, 
to the athlete, um, you could take the best kids, and I, you know, I've had some really good kids, and um, you might as well go bang your head against the wall because it, 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 you know, they have to go home, and at the end of the day, they're going to try to satisfy them. They're going to follow the message that the parents get them. You know what I mean? So even though you guys are doing like with the mindset stuff, and you're working with the athletes. It, it's actually very similar to what we're doing because the, the parents can, yeah. if they send a different message and the language is, people don't understand the language is very, very, very important, you know, that the kids use with themselves and that the parents are using with their their children, you know, and that uh, those things uh, tremendously impact. Like for me as a coach, part of my decision-making in people that you uh, can invest a lot of time in has to do with your ability to work with the parents or their parents to not be in your way. Yes. You know, so when you have an, when you have um, a parent who's willing to listen, they're on board and they're gonna work together in conjunction with you, then you know that you're gonna, uh, your time is gonna be well spent and there's gonna be get, you're gonna get getting return on your time. But if, you, if that's not the case, uh, you're just that's fighting when it, enough. That's when it happen. works. Right, that's, when, when, that's it works. when it works. That's when it works. Right. So, I mean, there are, there are you know, plenty of parents that have made incredible sacrifices for their kids to be successful in wrestling. And, and, and you know, there's, there's some good and, and there's some bad, um, but you know, one, one person comes to mind uh, for me is uh, Joe Mahako. And, you know, he invested a lot of time in making Steve good, but he allowed the coaches to do their, yes. their job. And so, um, you know, I think they provide an incredible opportunity for him. Uh, even even when he traveled overseas, young Joe would go and, and travel with him, mm -hmm. but they provided, and they, I think they did the same with their daughters. Yes, yes. And, and um, you know, so I take my, my hat off to that parent. Um, you know, as a, as a young guy, uh, as young kids, I think he brought them everywhere, and then I, he slowed down on that, and maybe I can't answer for him, but maybe he realized that I need to be under one watch instead of, mm -hmm. You know, having uh, you know a whole kitchen of, of chefs working with with my kids, um, but you know, I, if that father did not push his kids the way that he did, I don't think he would have had the success that all his kids had on different levels. You know, whether they were a doctor or they were a wrestler or yeah. uh, a, a, a jiu a, a, a judo um, athlete. You know, his kids were were really successful. So I wouldn't say that. Um, all parents uh, are bad, but just how they, how they, uh, and, and you know, me as a me as a father, um, and I coach my son. Um, I didn't want to coach him, and uh, you know, he demanded that I coach him. And you know, you know, I said, I want to be your dad. I don't want to be your coach. And he goes, I want you to coach me. And so, you know, I made him do you know several things to earn that because I felt that he needed to earn that. Um, and um, he turned out to be first guy in, last guy to leave. Um, uh, he, he, was, he was fun to coach um, and he had, a, he had a good attitude. It's just weird when somebody says, hey dad, when you're in the, when you're in the wrestling room. Um, but it, it was um, an incredible experience for me. I learned a lot by it. Um, and the one thing as a coach I always have tried to do is try to teach, try to teach, teach, uh, try to keep everybody under the guidelines that this is my son. What would I do in my son's situation? Would I wrestle him here or would, would I rest him in this match? If he's got an injury, would I wrestle him or would I rest, uh, would I rest him? And so I try to look at you know, those decisions as, as a parent because as a parent you know things about your kid and I think that's important in the process of being a coach and working with a parent um, and trying to make the, the, the kid the best the best, best person you can be. The one thing that I think parents do a little bit too quickly is they blame the coach. You know, the, if my kid loses, it's the coach's fault. And um, uh, they don't always know what's happening in the room. Um, they don't always know uh, how how if they're proper, if they're preparing properly for that, but the first blame will be on the coach. Why didn't you Why didn't you get them ready for this? You know, I had a parent call me up. Uh, my son wasn't ready for the uh, the U14 tournament, 
And my answer was, no shit, he shouldn't have been there. But he, he got this valuable experience um, and he's gonna know what to expect the next time. But you, you know, you're blaming me for not preparing him properly. He didn't belong in the tournament from the from the first part. Now he knows what to expect. And you know, sometimes you have to go through this. Like, you know, going to Fargo for the first time. It's it's one. It's a grind, and you've got to be prepared for the grind. Or you know, going to the Beast of the East. That's a grind. You know, it's. Uh, but when you do those things, you're doing those things and making those decisions. Yes. Or counts counseling those kids, those athletes to do those things with a purpose, you know what your objective is and why you're sending the young kid there to get, that that's part of the journey, that's part of the process, you know what I mean? Like I, I would say like, and what he said about, um, you know, the parent blaming somebody, like I don't think it's like that, that has to do with the, again, helping the, the athlete on the mental side about always blaming somebody for things that yeah, you no. shouldn't be blaming at all. Right, so learning to take ownership of your situation and yes. take responsibility, and this is what it is, and teaching the parents to say not use that language and trying to always blame somebody for, or or teach the athlete or their, in their, their child in this case, like I find somebody to blame, like, find somebody to blame. I didn't wrestle. Right, it's the, it leads them yes. to nowhere, you know. And so in trying to, if if there's patterns of behavior, you know, it's, again speaks to like mastering the process of okay, we lost a match. What is what it, we went to a tournament? We went to an event. We either won or lost the match. What is the process now? We come back. We go to the room. We talk to the coach. We we learn from what took place, right? He's coaching Rivera at the Worlds. You go. To, he has a good experience. He has a bad experience. It doesn't really matter. The process is the same. He's mastered the process. So he takes the athlete. He goes over what what you know. What can we learn from the, this experience? Where are we gonna pull from it? You know, and then where do we go with that information that we just got by participating in that event? And how can we use that to get us better? You know what I mean? I don't think they go, it's a loop. You know, it's, it, it's just an ongoing loop of each event that you go to, it's a reevaluation. And, and I think when kids practice, like they don't, there's no reflection, you know, like they, if, if I went to go with you and you and I are wrestling, we're competing in practice and then we're sitting out and we're taking a break for a minute, I should be reflecting on what I just did with you, what took place in that exchange, the positions that I was in, the kind of things that took place, and then going back out and trying to make adjustments, you know, but that the mental side of it is something that, like, as I've gotten older, um, I know there's a percentage of athletes out there who do these things intuitively without guidance and they know how to do it. But I also know that there's the far, large majority of them can't figure it, they can't figure it out. And just because they go to an Ivy League school, sometimes that even complicates it more for them yeah. to navigate those waters. So they need to be, they need to have guidance on, say what were, like Coach and I have talked, had these conversations, you say to the athlete, what were you thinking at this moment? What was your thought process? You knew the scenario, this was the situation in the match. And what were you what were you thinking? And they need to be walked through. And, and um, I don't I don't think a lot of coaches could do that also. Yeah. No. They, right. they, 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 Nor did they take the time, maybe, yeah. I don't know, but, but uh, they, they, it's I, valuable. I, it's I, important. Important. For some reason I have a, a like a video camera in my mind yeah. that I can go back and I see something and why did you do this? Tell me why you did this, why did you know right. You could probably tell, like they didn't know what they were doing in that moment. They don't know what they were thinking or they didn't have yes. a plan. Yes what was going on, and you pinpoint what was going on in that moment, and like being able, a coach would have to have that eye for where, right. you know, it's, seeing the kid. It's the, it's the difference between, it's the difference between the athlete and the coach, like one year, me and him were sitting together at the kid states, it was down like Morristown or somewhere, and we were having a conversation, and some parents from, I think they were guys on your team, or someone was gonna be going to, to your school, mm -hmm. um, were sitting behind us, and they were listening to me and him talking, and when we got done, t mm -hmm. I, we, we were done talking, he had to go coach somebody, I did, and the parents said to me, listening to you guys talk was like listening to like two doctors talk about medicine or something. And, and, it's a high level discussion. And I had no idea what, what you guys were talking about. But everything is very, what he's speaking to is everything's very visual. Yeah. So he, he can walk through the position and I see the position in my mind or I say a position to him and he sees it in his mind. But this is a skill set that like only your elite level athletes have. And a lot of kids don't have that app, that aptitude or they need to cultivate that uh -huh. and the young kids they need to learn to be able to do that it helps them in their growth it helps them in their development yeah. but it doesn't come without their mind being connected to what they're doing you know what i mean yeah just doing is watching like, video you know, helps that yes yeah. well i mean but i mean i i'm in a way different situation than um most any coaches 
I'm coaching senior level, college, high school, junior high, and then uh, elementary. So I full get a, I get a, a full gambit, um, and 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 even in from the competing side of it, you know, one weekend I'll be at the World Championships, and then the next weekend I'm at the uh, Sunoco Open. Yeah. So um, you know the the ability to uh, see a lot of wrestling, and then the fact that. You know, some days I'm on the mat for eight hours, some days I'm on the mat for four hours. I mean, the lowest I'm usually on the mat is four hours. Um, but that's a, that's a lot of mat time and it's a lot of ability to um, see a lot of different wrestling. So, you know, of course, my mind is, is trained that way. Um, but, you know, even as an, as an athlete, and I think you, you teach this, is to have kids visualize. And, um, you, you know, and trying to not just visualize of having their hand raised, but to visualize yourself going through particular wrestling moves and, and seeing that, that, you know, how you should finish, where you're, you're, you know, every little piece of your body, where, where those pieces are, they're, they're in the right positions. Um, you know, the, you know, Ernie brought up a, a point of, you know, winning and, and losing. What I try to do with kids is, uh, be satisfied that you wrestled really hard and not focusing on the winning and the losing. Um, and I, I think you're going to have a lot more fun, and, you know, and, and, you know, especially gearing up for that match. Um, I hope I don't lose. I hope, I, how can anybody have a mindset like that and, and, and try and try to win, you know, like, but just to try to relax and to visualize, you know, things that you're going to do out on a mat. I think you guys do a really good job with that um, but when do when do people really have their best performances when they're having fun and um, to, to try to be able to relax and let it fly um, so like you know Dylan Shaver this weekend um, he's lost to Ragson two times and he let it fly during the match and he ends up pecking the guy um, you know, an amazing performance. Um, but what I would say that uh, he has worked on um, from almost uh, September when he wrestled at the U23 Worlds in Albania, uh, he had an opportunity to sit down and talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and he, you know, he, he came out of, he lost his first match. And he, so we had a lot of time together alone uh, but he says, what do I have to do to get better? And so, uh, you know, basically set a, a game plan up. But um, I said, there's one, one thing that you have to do. Uh, you have to believe. And you, I said, you can do all these things and you can put in all of this time. Uh, and you have to, you have to put in the, the, the right effort, the right time to make practice meaningful. Uh, not going through the, the motion. Um, and your practices can't be practices, they gotta be training. And, and he goes, what do you mean by that? And I said, practice to me is um, doing something without any real... Um, Chuck in the box. Yes. Training, you're, you're, trying to, practice. you're trying to get better at certain positions. Conscious. So, and I, I think you showed me something at one point where, um, you made game planning for kids. Yeah. And so, um, to me, that's, that's, that's crucial. And so what this kid does to me now, he walks up maybe for practice, what am I focusing on today? And I wish he could do that for himself, but he feels comfortable with I, what I have to say. Um, and, uh, you know, like when I'm working with kids on private lessons, they come in and I say to them, what do you want to work on? And I already have a game plan, but I want to know. I want to know what they want to work on, and if uh, and if they come in, and they say I don't know. I punch them <laughs> because it, it makes me angry. Um, it, you know, so it's like you you you're paying me money to teach you some wrestling skills. You better have an idea of what we're going to do, and um, I'm trying to make them think outside of um, of 
making them more responsible for their wrestling. So I, I have a kid I work with. Um, he's made incredible jumps this year. Um, his name is Ryan DeGeorge. And um, he was one of those kids. I don't know. What do you want to work on? And, and the process changed this year. Being in high school, I think, helped him out a lot. Um, but he took um, more um, pride in his own wrestling and what he needs to think about and what he needs to do. And this kid started believing. Um, and, you know, he told me midway through the season, I'm gonna win the States. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, well, you, you are getting better. And, um, you know, the, we were doing some very simple stuff, stance. And it's, you know, he's a long, tall kid. And, and every, every practice was revolved around our hand fighting and our stance. And he, he got, because he's long, he was exposing his legs to people um, too much and he wasn't putting himself in the right ties. Um, but he went through the process of knowing what he had to do every day, which I think is important, and believing in the process and, and taking more responsibility instead of, I want you to do this, here's what I want to do today. And I, even as a ninth grader, um, you know, he, he really, really developed this year. Yeah. I, you know, that whole box checking thing, I think psychologically what's going on there, one, just to having a mentality, I'm getting practices in. I'm putting more time in. I got another practice in check. They do that with the mindset too. Mm -hmm. Mindset training. I got my mindset. Can I session. throw another yeah. word at you? Yeah. I'm trying to let him use the word training. Yeah. I think it's more effective. Learn how to train instead of I'm going to practice. Right. That's practice. checking the box. We're talking time. about practice? It's practice, man, not a game, not a game. So, the, so it's the box checking mentality. Also, these kids are so used to their parents controlling everything, mm -hmm. so they're not practice, they're not training to think mm -hmm. right. for themselves. And then the third thing I think is the starstruck factor. I'm going to Ernie Monaco or Jeff Buxton, I'm gonna tell them what I think I should work on. I'm afraid I might get hit if I tell you what, mm -hmm. what, what I think they, I should they, be working they, on. They know me. Yeah. If you're doing a private lesson with me, yeah. they know me. And you know, for you know, the first time they walk in, I don't know, whatever you want to do. I don't know. That doesn't fly after that day. No, it doesn't fly. Yeah. But, but you train them to think that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I, like I tell them, this really bothers me. Yeah. Well, you have to, because yeah. otherwise, how do they know to change that? Yeah. How How was it with some of your best guys? Like, I, I think the early days, I think he with. The uh, Pritzlovs, Espositos, Logan, all those guys. You know, you would get the state booklet. It's all edge guys, right? And I think with you, with all the guys, I think, you know, Espo and, 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 and Perry and Bacchus and Mako and all those guys. How, how do you think you've changed since then? What did, the, what did those guys bring to the table? Are the guys the same now as what they did? What would, what would you have done the same or different with those guys? Anything like that. I know it's, I know it's a huge question, but like... I think you have to, I think the, for both of us, I mean, to be around for this long, yeah. you have to continue to evolve, improve, and get better. You can't stay the same. So um, there's a guy who used to uh, be part of my program, Lou's net, is a doctor and now lives in Tennessee, and he comes up to visit his parents back in New Jersey, and he wants to stop by, and he's, he's working with his son, who's now like a freshman mm -hmm. or sophomore in high school, and he's asking whether the stuff he learned back in the day is still relative to now. You know, and I, I, I think the fundamental things, the principles and the concepts are always, if they're, if they're solid, it's like a, building a foundation of a house. Um, they're always relative and they're always of value. Um, but there's trends and things that happen in the sport and it takes different directions that you have to adapt and adjust to what's going on. I think like the point that coach made about like nowadays with the video and, the, and having, to, we have different tools at, at your disposal that you didn't have in years past. And, and I think also the athletes that we're training are different. They're growing up in a different world in a different time. So they're used to that instant gratification of being getting likes on social media and different things like that. So trying to teach someone to buy into your process, which I think he does, you know, we, we do it, uh, we do it, we, we know they have to believe, that's part of the believe part of it, but if they have to 
be willing to defer gratification and, and understand that we're both in this for the long, we're playing the long game, we're not playing the short game. So whereas most of society, you're competing as a coach, you're competing with society, which is sending the, kid, the, mess, the kids messages and the parents are sending the kids messages and sometimes their coaches are sending the kids the messages that we need to win now. What's important right now is that we, we, you know, we win now. Um, and it's not a necessary, I don't know if this would be the right way to say it, but it's not a developmental approach where they're, it's, it's, it's just stepping stones. It's like writing a, a paragraph and just building um, or solving a math problem and just doing one step after the other and just following steps. It's a progression, you know. So for me, as a, as a, it's, as a coach, I, uh, if you talk to somebody in different businesses, they, they'll say it's mechanics, like an uh, accountant following certain mechanics and you end up with X result. You know, we go to the mechanics of a problem. As a coach, I think for us, um, we have those processes down and systems down so that you, um, you know, dealing with the deviations that come, like when he's working with an athlete and then they get influences from other places or different variables enter into the mix. It changes, it changes. Uh, some you take, some you don't take. Yeah, it's difficult. It makes it more of a, it's a, it's a challenge because you have, if they, if you stay with, it's like I know how to make the soup, and I'm going to put these ingredients in the soup, and I, I know what the result's going to be at the end of at the end of the day. Um, but now you add different variables to that, and you change the chemistry, and it's going to, you're not going to get a different result, a different product. So whether it's the parents, or whether it's society, whether it's the different variables, other coaches, or whatever it may be, um, they can derail the train and and um, take it off the track and. Uh, they pose challenges sometimes in the, in the developmental process, you know what I mean? It's like having somebody who's a general contractor build a house and he's in charge of everything that goes on and, and, yeah. and oversees all the, 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 the different um, guys that do the different work, the electricians and the plumbers and so on, right? And he's overseeing everything and that's the role that him or I would be in. And then you have somebody, you know, come in and you, you have another guy who's trying to GC the job and he's got a different approach to, to the the way that he goes about That's building when they're it. jumping clubs or going to yeah, different from yeah from all of those things it's and it, and it makes it it's it's very difficult for i think the public doesn't realize like if you look at his track record and the success that he's had right and you look at someone like me and and the success that i've had over the years and you crystallize it down like it's the lives of the kids that you're able to touch and you have relationships with that you have an, you put have an imprint on and that you work more closely with those kids go on to have more success mm -hmm. so why did they have more success than some of the other kids that might have been through your program the buy-in level is different buy you know the leo like someone the athletes at east coast they buy in more mm -hmm. so the result is different because the buy-in is different so he if he talks to the parents they're on board the kids on board they follow the program they follow the process they follow the system right he, he had one of my athletes was going up um, to train up up at when he was coaching in high school and he called me up on the phone. He says, what's he doing up here? Right. And I said, I don't know. Right. And he says, why is he here? He's coming up two, three days a week. You know, it was, oh. it was Alex Crusoe. Oh, right. So he said he, he needs a system. He's on the wall. Right. But before he won a state title, he said he needs, he said that he needs a system. He says, Ernie, he needs a system. And we had this conversation about like what he's all jumbled up. Right. So he came back and then I, I told him that I talked to coach Buxton. Coach Buxton called me on, on your behalf. Right, because he's interested in helping you, and he, you're coming up here, and you don't, you're all over the map, and he's saying to you, Alex, what do you want to do? Like, you, you need to be one, you know, one way or another way. You can't be all different ways. And uh, I had the conversation. I told him that we spoke, and I told him that he was trying to help him by giving him this advice. And then I came back and I said he wanted somebody to work with him really closely, and I asked Dave Esco if he would work with Alex really closely, and that that year he won a state title, right? But because. Dave took an interest in him. Alex bought into the program. He he threw a, him a, a a life raft by saying to him, "Listen, you need to get a sense of direction. You're all over the map. You know, you're you're doing this on on you know you're going down here on on these days. You're going over here on these days. You're at this on these days, and that's uh you know it's the rare kid that I've seen over the years that can succeed with that kind of a approach. You know, there are those who can do it, but it's very rare. You know, but I think for the most part, like." If people were to invest and, and, and follow what he has to offer, you're going to be successful. You know, if they come to me and, and frankly, he doesn't have the time, you know, and I don't have the time. That's the problem. 
Well, he, we know the process. We know the system. Getting people to believe and follow it is, I think, probably, I don't know if you'd agree, right? It's, I agree it, with you 100%. It, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. So it's like, it's like, a, it's like a, you see, watch Shark Tank and somebody says, what does it cost to uh, educate the consumer about your product? How much is it costing you to, to get the consumer to know about your product, to buy your product? It, that cost is, is, in wrestling, it's, it's, it's large. Right, so like uh, Sean Brumet, coaching at Michigan, was running, um, you know, a club in in Illinois, right, and doing a fantastic job, and then all of a sudden, Illinois became New Jersey, and 50 million other clubs spread it up, and the the common consumer, the wrestling parent in the wrestling community, doesn't un they can't discern the difference between uh, an elite coach or somebody who has that kind of a background, and somebody who just hangs out a shingle says. You know, come to my garage. I, I'm going to provide you with, with some mat time. You know, and then you, in his role, like, you know, where somebody who's more experienced, you have to go out and then compete in that marketplace to try to uh, educate the consumer to say, I have a different approach or whatever it is. And that take it's, you don't have the it takes forever to do that. He can't go out and he can't go to <laughs> get a bullhorn and go to the tournaments and say to everybody, look, look, I know what I'm doing. You know, I'm not gonna do that. No, no, I know that. But <laughs> you know, the point like no one's gonna do that. And neither did Sean. That's why he's yeah. coaching college yeah. again. Right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that's why yeah. that's what happened. And I told him ten years before that, I said, You're gonna have success and I, and literally, you know, said to him, like when you know, when New Jer when Illinois becomes New Jersey, it's gonna be a it's a whole different thing. Yes. And that's exactly what happened. But they yeah. dominated, you know, he did such an outstanding job and they dominated, but the but the public you know the parents who you're dealing with and we're dealing with they have trouble for whatever reason they you know they they there's got to be a level of buy-in yeah but so now it's like there's a few things there's knowing what the system is i guess that's the very practical like what should the kids be doing from when they enter the sport how should the parents and the kids be approaching the sport obviously they can't all go to you guys or to, you know people all across the country right, right. What do they do? Do they find, like, how do you find- Why don't you take it from the top even? When do you start? I know there's no perfect answer for this. When when should a kid start wrestling? When should he start going to a club? What are the first few, few things he should be actually learning? No answer, but I'm curious to hear what you guys say. Um, when should a kid first get on the mat? When should well, he first go to a wrestling well, first, club? First, they have to be old enough to be able to understand how to get through a practice. And so, like, um, you know, we have some kids running around a club that are this big, and they're all together. Yeah. And and a, 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 a lot of it is social and fun, mm -hmm. of you know, putting them in positions and and then having them uh, try to try to learn, you know, a few positions each night. Um, I think when you throw the competing part onto it, that's when it gets difficult. Right. And so. Um, competing at tournaments or compete just just go live in the room. Any, in any okay. Way. Anyway, yeah, even yes, in the room. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and so there's a, a certain skill set needed um, in competing. And you know, like I said to you before, that I think we're in the U.S. We're way up ahead of um, other countries with our younger kids competing because they do it more often. Um, they know how to compete. They know how to wrestle hard. Um, and you'll you'll see. Um, certain kids go through um, being nine and 10 and 11 and 12 years old that they're killing other kids. And by the time they're 14 and 15, the other kids have caught up. And, and sometimes there's that reverse effect of where they're not as successful as they were when they were younger and the other kids have come up, that sets a, a different mindset with, with that particular kid. And I've, I've unfortunately seen that too often um, where kids were really, really successful at a younger age, because they were more the norm, that's yeah. more the more common. They were the opposite. They were stronger. Yeah. Um, uh, they were way tougher, uh, and they knew how to compete at a younger age. And you know, either it, it, it's maturing and having some hormones get into your body, and um, you know, things change at age 15, 16. You'll you, you know, you see that all the time. Um, and where a kid was successful too young, um, and now he's losing, it's really hard. And I think I think that there's the tricky part for me is I think people in general 
you you find a station in life and whatever we do whether it's sports or just life in general and you say this is where I am this is where I'll be I'm never going to be a millionaire I'm never going to be this or that this is what I am whatever your profession may be this is what you make now this is not true of everyone it's true of a lot of people yeah. and they settle at that that's where you're stuck so what hap it happens with athletes in that it, the kids learn like like Shane Griffith is an example nine time kid state champion he could be down he's been pulling rabbits out of the hat since he was a little boy and he the way he wins at the division one level now or, or was when he has success um, his best success was the same as when he was a youth it hasn't changed right he always had that ability to find a way to to win and pull something out but what happens is if it's parents, incredible it's incredible it is incredible yes but on the on the flip side of it the kids who suffer from who from they lost a couple of matches is and the parent places a huge impact a huge value on the match and they don't handle the loss the right way that's a learning experience that that's never going to be forgotten so they're sending that kid the wrong message at that moment and if those too many of those moments occur and they're not handled correctly they just painted that kid into a his future is very very difficult and for the coach like him or, or I try to overcome that is sometimes impossible right because you the parent has the, there's been damage done by whether it was the coach who was working with them, whoever the individual was working with them that they mishandled that situation and although the, the individual may have tremendous talent right but they didn't win Tulsa Nationals or they didn't do this or that or whatever it is they uh, it scars them and they can never overcome that so as a result they never reach their full potential but on the flip side if you talk about when you start the kids like what age to start the kids when they start like trying to teach them that they're running I use the example of they're running around a track around the curve and you have a staggered start and you're running around the bend and as they're coming around the curve you don't know which individuals in first or where they're going to be as they come out of that curve but when they come out of the curve and they arrive in high school or they arrive in college now you see okay we're ahead but as a youth like coach Bucks I'm saying they're they're you know you may be behind but society's saying you're they're you're failing because you're behind and if you don't do a good job as a coach or as a parent at saying to that individual we're taking a little different path our path's a little different. We don't need to win right now. We're here not to win this event, right? We, it doesn't matter whether we win or lose this event. We're here to learn from what we're doing and we're gonna get better and take a few steps forward. And in the end, down the road, all these guys right now that are ahead of us, they think that winning is right, really important. We're gonna be ahead of them. But you have to be willing to believe, right? And go through this process and understand that at the end, you'll emerge on top. But there's going to be some sacrifices that are involved with this approach because it's not the normal Glamorous. approach. It's not yeah. the common approach. And that's the challenge because now you have to try to tell, hope the parents buy into, we're taking a long-term approach to this. He's going to lose some matches. I asked him to do this on, the, on in this situation, right? I asked him to um, choose the bottom because I, w I was willing to lose the match to learn because we need to work on the bottom because there's going to come a day in time where you're gonna have to go down and you're gonna have to get out or you're gonna have to ride or you're gonna have to do this. And if you don't do it now, learn it now and prepare now. And, when, and under pressure. Under pressure, right. Then then you're not gonna be able to do it when the time is called to do it, you understand? So they so they can't, like, I example, I, I can give you an example. I use like Mike McGall to wrestle the Anthony National, right? And, and he wrestled them like three times in a, um, during it, one time in the season, one time in a tournament, then in the districts, the regions, and the states, right? Each time we wrestled him, we chose the bottom. Each time he chose the bottom, he got pinned, right? And I knew each time he that we're getting one step closer to getting out, one step closer to getting out, each time that we chose it. And in the state finals, he wrestled them again, and we chose the bottom, and he got out. And that's the only one that mattered to me was that state finals match. In the region, he got pinned but we figured it out. We would have never figured it out had he not chose the bottom and, and went through that learning process, right? So I know that that one point was valuable. We didn't, we, didn't, we lost a close match. He wrestled well, Anthony's a tremendous wrestler. So, you know, that's not the, the, the point, but the point is that I was willing to say, he, Mike bought in, the parents bought in, and they were willing to say, 
okay, we know you're going to go down. We know there's a risk that he's going to get pinned. This kid pins everybody from the top, right? He's going to armbar you, you're going to pin you. But the only way we were going to get to the other side was the obstacle is the way, right? We're going to take the steps. That's the, that's the path. We're going to follow those. So you ask what age? I, I can't give you an age. I think it's it's more when that it's a readiness. Yes. Though. Yeah. So it's a readiness to just go into a wrestling practice and quickly little kids find a way if it's fun. And to me, it's it's got to be fun. They gotta they gotta be going in there and, and having a good time. They also have to wrestle. Right. Yeah. And, you know, like if you try to do instruction for yes, you can. You can, but you got to put them in positions so they can learn. And then gradually, I think you put them in, in competing positions and then making them wrestle matches in the room, um, you know, too, I think too quickly, um, it's like, right, let's go see what we can do. Right. And, um, yeah. it, it, you know, if it, if it turns out with a loss, um, you know, nobody likes doing that. And, and you're not sure if they're gonna come back from it. Um, I don't think, uh, a lot of kids at a younger age are willing to say, I learned a lot by that loss. Um, and right. so, you know, that's, that's the pressure from either the coach or the parents or um, some, some type of pressure that they're feeling. But, um, you know, as, as you grow as an athlete, you learn way more from a loss than you do from a win. Um, you know, what are the things that you need to do better? Or, you know, a close match. Um, and having uh, that skill set to be able to, to win coming, you know, here's a, here's a scenario that really bothers me. And I got a guy that I, I work with with this um, quite a bit. And we, we put him in the, the situation over and over, try to make it as stressful as we possibly can be. Um, but he's better at winning when he's losing. And he's not as good if he's winning. That to me is crazy. You know, why don't you have the same mindset of, I dare you to touch my leg. I dare you to try to squaw on me right now. I am gonna, I'm gonna fight you as hard as I can in the center of the mat, and instead they're running away and they're, give, they're giving things up. And, and in trying to uh, develop that skill, I find really hard, and I usually do it when guys are tired, and, and I make them tired before we get to that where you're up by 30, you're up, you're down by 30, you're up by 15, you're down by 15, you're up by seven, you're down by seven, uh, with seven seconds left. Yeah. And trying to put them in those scenarios, but it's it's so hard to do because there's not the same pressure right. unless you've got two guys that are incredibly skilled against each other. You know, they're at the same level. Um, the good kid is gonna win every time. And, and you know, you asked about some guys that um, that I've worked with um, we at some point would uh, would do matches where um, we bring a fresh guy on, and the really good ones were battling the fresh guys. Like they wouldn't they wouldn't give up a point. They would fight every position, um, no matter how tired they were, and that's a champion. Yes. Um, and you know that's a certain uh, ability. To, to be able to fight and keep strong while you're tired. And you got a guy like that, they're pretty incredible. And there was Mike Gray. Yeah. I used, to, I used to throw guys at him, leave him in, and just throw fresh bodies at him, left and right. I wanted to see him get tired and break. And he would not break, he was very hard to break. You know, I didn't have the horses to push him the way he needed to be pushed. He still was highly successful. But if I had my way, you know, I had, I had a little, if he was around at a little different time, he would have had some real guys to come at him mm -hmm. that would have challenged him more and he would have even excelled even greater. But he, whatever you threw at him, he, you know, he was going to rise to the occasion. There's a character that speaks to his character. Yeah. I bet he it rose to the occasion. It blows my mind that a kid can be so different winning and losing. It blows my mind. I mean, that's... But I think that speaks to I think that speaks to the mental <coughs> side. Absolutely, the message that yeah. you the work that you guys have done, yeah, hundred percent. You know, yeah. And, and but that's embedded that he's dealing with what you're doing, talking about older athletes now. Yes. Yeah. So it's embed. That's what I'm saying to you. Look. So his question about like when when do you start with the kids? Uh, the readiness factor. You start when they're young, and then and I would do a for me I would do a hybrid approach like 
where you're doing a little bit what they're doing in Europe, trying to work on the, the kinesthetics and the body awareness and the tumbling and the gymnastics and the ability to prepare their body to learn, prepare, give them the physical skills and the foundation to be able to then do the move. Because you're asking kids, something my dad used to say all the time was, like, you're, you're asking kids to control their another person's body in a sport of wrestling, like scholastically, you get a rewarded points for controlling the other man's body, right? And they can't control their own body. Right. So how can you ask an individual, a young kid, to control somebody else's body when he can't, has a, the ability to, you know, shoot or mm -hmm. move in certain directions or change direction, do different things. So I think that building that, fa that the physical foundation which, like he was saying, they, they're older and they can do all these different things. So now you have this foundation in place that you can build upon and you can really run with it, whereas our athletes are not um, as physically able. There are those who are, but they're not, but they're not the amount that are, because they approach it differently than we approach it. Right. I would say the, the thing that's <coughs> changed probably the most uh, from when I was a kid wrestling is trying to develop a kid more athletically. Yes. And so, um, whether it's uh, gymnastics, um, your strength training, doing plyometrics, right. um, uh, stance in motion, I mean, yes. uh, it, you know, the ability to sprawl and, and working all those skill sets together, I think has really materialized, and, you know, especially to this, this point, like, when I was, high school kid we went in and we wrestled right and uh you know we had those horsehair mats and we tried to drag the guy's face across the mat as much as you can to get him the mat burn and run across um it you know there was a, a certain toughness involved in it um but we never had uh, the nutrition value um we never had the you know we go in a weight room and we just start throwing you know weights around we never had the the, the system that um you know i think is in play um, and fortunately, as a young coach, um, I brought a guy in and I made him evaluate my weightlifting system. It was Zach Ibanesh. And uh, he goes, you're killing him. And I, I go, help me, man. He goes, but he said, are your guys going in practice the next day sore from the lifting? Yeah. Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> and so... Uh, you know, he, he had me ease up on it, not spend as much time on it, and, and to be more efficient in what we were doing. Um, and, he, and he made me think about, a, you know, a lot of different ways of, of developing strength with, uh, with you know, just ropes and, and throwing, throwing things. You know, we, we would go out in the woods and we had a, a big uh, rock yeah, yeah. wall. You'd sit in the car, you have them push the car. Yeah, push the car. He'd be in the truck, and the yeah. kids would be behind the truck, pushing the truck, and he's stepping out the brake. <laughs> I, you know, I have, I, I ordered one time 30 wheelbarrows. Yeah. And so they had to put their partner in the wheelbarrow and wheel them up the mountains, down the mountains. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, just different ways of, of one, training your mind, right. um, but, the, but the other is being smart about uh, what you're doing, but to learn how to be explosive. And, uh, I, you know, unfortunately this guy has passed away. Another guy that helped me out a lot was Kurt Backus' dad. Um, you know, he, he was, um, he was, you know, how do you get a kid to be in ninth grade to be able to do what he did? And, you know, we used to talk about it a lot. And, you know, some of the things that he had his kid do um, were really, it was functional training before functional training was a thing. Yeah. Um, but you know that's you know when do you add that in on on, on the kids level um, and you know when do you add the nutrition and on the kids level um, when do you add the strength training on the kids well, level? I, I think like he see, he keeps using the word training and he's not even conscious of that he uses yeah. that word but like people would people would say like oh I'm going for a lift I'm going to go weight lift I want you to do my weight lifting you know what I mean. But I think it's important to distinguish like that. It's weight training, it's resistance training, yeah. you know, like you, and functional movements and, and those type of things. I think if you all that stuff, if you do it in a, in a spirit of play when they're little, yeah. and it's disguised like we're going to climb the monkey bars, yeah. we're going to go hand over hand across the monkey bars, and we're going to do different things. Zach Espo, like, grew up in 
he was born and sitting in a little car seat chair when his brothers were older. But as soon as he could crawl and walk and run, he tried to climb and do different things. So he's chasing, trying to compete with his older <coughs> brothers in a playful way, mm -hmm. right? But that that um, development and doing that was all done in a playful spirit. It developed his abilities, you know what I mean? So he becomes uh, unique and he's a very advanced for his age and some of the things that he could do. And it, it happened as a result of trying to compete with his older brothers and chasing them on the monkey bars and chasing them around doing different things or climbing and jumping and rolling and tumbling and all of those things are extremely important. I think to try to like in, in our business, for lack of a better word, um, I'm terrible so at business. When you try to <laughs> when you try to um, sell the public on there's value in tumbling, there's value in spending you know, we had like the, the guy who was at Rutgers, the world champion, come Martin. up and, and he's running them through a practice and they'll spend a half hour, 40 minutes just doing tumbling and stretching and neck bridges and rolling their ankles and their knees and, and all their joints before they get into yeah. into working. So the American public doesn't, they, they would not see value in that. Why aren't they going live? When are we going live? Why aren't they so wrestling? Here's, I mean, here's another example of strength training. Grab a leg. You're stuck down on two knees. Now you have to improve your position. So you have to do all the, the technical aspects, but that skill needs to be done over and over. You have to develop the the um, the, the muscle movement, the muscle strength uh, of being in that position and trying to uh, develop the coordination to, to move all through that. I will put guys in this every day. Fully extended Fully on ex your knees or yes. on your belly? Not, not on belly because you're in the terrible position. You've got to get back to your knees. But uh, on one knee, on a pivot position, on two knees, head on the inside, head on the outside, um, and you know you're you're trying to teach them how to create angles while they're down on the mat. Here's what a kid normally does. Yeah. <coughs> right. They squeeze, and they think they're gonna. And at a young level, they'll be successful if they're stronger than the other guy. At squeezing when you get to college everybody's strong um, and uh, it, it, you know I think those are little things that I don't think coaches do enough of you know developing building a base on bottom developing getting back to your knees developing running on your knees turning the corner getting your chest up um, developing on uh, wrestling through positions where you take a guy down and you're working to either get them into a turk, keep bellies out, you're getting to a wrist ride, you're going to your chop. Um, I don't think these are skills that people work hard enough on. Of, uh, of a guy coming off the bottom and mat returning. You know, kids at those at, at most levels will, will stop wrestling. And so that they, they never get the full, uh, what, do I, what do I have to do? How do I seal off the hands? How do I move my hips to get out of there? Because kids just let them go. And you know, when they're drilling, getting off the bottom, it's just let them, it pisses me off. Yeah. So it's. I think well, that's true what he's saying, but I think that if you don't have what you do, and you don't have it up here, what's well, it's, it's all it, it's all it's none of it. it. You could you could do you could have the best coach in the world, and he can put you through all the drills and do and 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 have you train physically to do all the right things. But if at the moment, like he said, under pressure. The lights come on, and you don't, and you can't, you can't perform, or your mind is not where it needs to be. No matter what your background is, you're, you're, uh, you forget about underperforming. I mean, it's, you're going to not represent. You, it's not going to be no way indicative of what you've trained to do, what you've been trained to do. You're not even going to represent your coach, your family, or anybody the way that you're capable of doing it. But, but because but, you can't but put doing it those under pressure, that's how you learn that. If guys, guys will look for the easy way out. Yeah, but I don't think I think like I think so. so I think like the like average in, guy. You're, you're you're right in different environments. Like you know, because you've had the the experience that you have has been vast. But like it like up when you had them captive and you're you're in your high school room, that's different because there's no uh, there's limited outside influences. But like now as a club coach and you're dealing with those guys, what they do in the room is, is and, and what they do outside the room could be two, two vastly yeah. different things. What about other sports? Do you see the value in some kids that maybe actually play other sports at a high level that come to you a, bit, a little bit later with maybe some more athleticism? Do you think it's a distraction? I'm going to use myself as an example. Yeah. I played three sports in high school, and I played two in college. And um, 
at some point the breaks were good, um, but I always wrestled. I always played lacrosse. I mean, lacrosse is so much fun. You know, for me, wrestling, I love going to practice. I'm, I know I'm a little different, um, but I, I like the training. I like um, the pressure. I like physically uh, doing that. Lacrosse was so much fun. You know, and, and uh, you know, football, uh, I wish I was bigger. I wish I was 6'4". <laughs> Instead, I was 5'7", 135 pounds. And, but I love playing football. And um, I probably was a little bit behind when I got to college uh, because I played three sports. But I love playing three sports. And you know what it did for me athletically were, um, you know, I was, I was fast, I was strong. Um, you know, I could, I could get into positions that other people wouldn't get into. I, you know, I maybe, uh, uh, and, but, you know, this is 60s, 70s. That's what everybody did. Yeah. Everybody played three sports. Um, you know, not too many people played two sports in college, but, um, it, it, you know, as I was lucky. I had older brothers that were college athletes. So, you know, I was, a, you know, he's talking about the Espositas. I, I was around that. I could go to their lacrosse practice and I'm, you know, 12 years old and I have a, an, an All-American teaching me how to shoot. I mean, that's, to me, amazing. You know, when I think back at it, you know, the the opportunities that I had with my older brothers was amazing. And all we did was play and compete. If we were in the house playing cards, it was competition. We're outside, we're shooting baskets, we're making up games. We're playing stickball. Um, we're playing home run derby. I mean, it didn't matter what the, you know, it was all kinds of different sports. Today, I mean, it's, it's you, yes. Today you see a kid, he can't throw a ball. Like, you know, to me that's amazing. But you watch uh, uh, some of these foreign athletes, they can play some soccer. But there are studies though, like my brother, he would yeah. share with me these, these information, it's amazing. You know, he said like, they, they do studies on like the Olympic athletes and the people who medal. And they said that the majority of them come to the sport late, later in life, and as a second sport, like it wasn't their hmm. chosen thing. They're not prodigies. Like you would think they're prodigies of something, but they, it's not the case. Hmm. Now I don't know in, in wrestling if that always applies, but they they across the board on the Olymp on the Olympic level, they started out down a different path, and then they went into swimming, or they went into ice skating, or they took up volleyball, or they took up basketball, or they went into a different direction, and then they they excelled at that. But they were they they had built a athletic base like he's talking about and then they decided I'm going to do this for fun they were passionate about it and they pursued their goals very passionately I think in wrestling you you know it's it's tough to strike that balance I think the breaks are needed I think for me every individual is different like some people their outlet would be to do another sport but I don't think it has to come in another sport in the form of a sport it could be in music it could be in in running it could be in anything you know what i mean it, it could just be in relaxing and taking having some downtime or just getting in the gym and lifting and some guys just enjoy enjoy you know weight training but you um i think understanding the uh the cycles and how i always say rest is part of your training right it's 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 part of the process it's not something separate from it it's part of the process and right and the mental side as well so you have to you have to build that into their, that's, uh, we're talking about like tournaments, when to go to what tournament. It's part of their training cycle. You know, it's the Olympic athlete is training for an Olympic cycle. There's, there's a, a map, there's a blueprint. On, I'm gonna go to this event, that event, th I should be here by this stage of the game, I wanna be there. Whether it's weight cutting, and uh, whether it's cardiovascular, like their conditioning, all those different pieces fit in together and it's all, there's a map for it. It's not, it's not just, um, Arbit you know, arbitrary, just do whatever, and this is where I want to be. The time is now to take your mindset to the next level with Wrestling Mindset. Make sure you go to our website, WrestlingMindset.com, and sign up for your free trial session today. Don't wait any longer. You want the mental edge right now. When you sign up for the free trial session, you're also going to get a copy of our free ebook 
Building the Predator Mindset. This book has helped thousands of people build confidence, relax under pressure, get motivated, and build mental toughness in wrestling, school, and life. Make sure you sign up for your free trial session today. And leading into what you know, Ernie's saying, I think as little kids, I would rather see jamborees. Where there's there's no trophies, um, there's no out of bounds, there's you know just kids in there and, and playing in positions. Yeah, I, I mean I think I look at the Soviet books, right? And it's like they they start off gymnastics, soccer, basketball, just just play, just become athletic. And there's different things they're trying to do with their body. And then like their curriculum, like looking at like Yuri Shakamaradov's thing. Again, this is different. This is Soviets. 10, 11 years old, that's a year one of wrestling training. 11, 12, 12 to 13, and they have it all very much blocked out. Your first major success should come in six years. You should reach your potential, we're, we're world class level by eight or nine years. The difficulty there is now you're in America, what are the goal, what are the, what's the main goal of most people coming in? I know there's some people who are trying to be Olympic champ, very, very few. Even NCAA champ, I think what we see, most of the kids, they're coming, even parent at a young age, they like their kid to be a state champ, get into college, wrestled, wrestle in college, do well division one, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. That's a different- it's good life. <laughs> yeah, right. That's good life. That's phenomenal. Yes. But, had, but had, so now, but you apply the Soviet model, you start the kid wrestling at 10, 11 years old. Mm-hmm. Okay, colleges are gonna be looking at them, what they're doing 14, 15, 16. You know, they, I mean, you it, can't apply the it's no, you can't apply that right. right. It's a different place. So, so how do we take the best of both worlds? So how do we take what that what the Soviets have with all that research? I think we try to do it. Yeah, yeah. We, we try to do it. Right. Yeah, we do it the I mean, best the best we can. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of things that yeah. Uh, We're gonna do that. that play, there's you gotta keep these things on. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. business. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I I fight with the people at my club. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example. I call Ernie up right away. Um, they wanted me to go to five, five practices a week. And I said, I will have a hard time teaching continuity for five, five days a week. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm not going to get the same guys all five days a week. Right. And that word that he used is the key, is the whole key to everything is the continuity of learning. If you don't have that, and that's the thing with the hopping that he, he's, you know, we, I mean, I, I admire this guy a lot. You know, he, we would talk all the time about different things over the years and, and he, he was working with athletes and I say, Buck, what do you do in this situation? He's like, I won't work with them. He goes, they're all over the place. I can't, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm spinning my wheels. I'm going to work with the people who are on board, who kind of believe in what I'm doing and everything else. It's hard business though. It's very, it's very very hard business. It's very hard, right. But there's people who are out there who will. Uh, I can't. I can't do this. Give me money. Right. <laughs> Go back to that. I can't thing. do that. Right. That's not me. Right. So you say like I, I my accountant said to me years ago. Right. He said I came back and we we did well in some event and the kids did pretty good and I don't know some whatever they give you some ridiculous trophy which to me didn't mean anything at all but like the team or whatever it's not about it's not, it was never about that for me so I he said obviously you and I keep keep score in two different ways so he's an accountant obviously so he's thinking financially you know i'm not doing too well and i'm i'm thinking i'm doing really great my kids are developing they're getting better and better and I'll, and and, and yeah. that's what i measure my success based on how my kids are doing not by how i line my pockets but that's not normal and i i understand like he said we're a little different um we're coaches so at the, at the core of who we are we're coaches and we're people who work closely with with, with kids you know and have these relationships uh, that we built for over a long period of time, but the 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 average person isn't you know you go to school for business and you're in business to make money, but we're not business people. You know we're we're doing it. We're using that as a vehicle to do what we love to do. You know and like he said, we still need to keep the lights on and do all those other things, but um, it's very hard to strike that balance. And ultimately, if you can see the kids that you work with and the lives that you've touched, and those guys go on to live like good lives. And, and have success in whatever endeavor they're doing. It doesn't have to be wrestling. Um, that's really what it's all about because there's gonna be very few of them that who choose to be coaches and, or like you said, go on to try yeah. to compete at the what Olympic this, level. What this sport gives the kids is an amazing thing. Yeah. It's amazing. It, you know, it teaches you a certain toughness. Um, it, it teaches you 
to be disciplined. It, it teaches you to be <clears throat> humble. Um, we've, we've moved away from that a little bit. Um, there's a lot more celebrating now. Um, but, uh, you know, I think for the most part, part uh, wrestlers are very <coughs> humble, humble guys. Um, uh, uh, you know, to, to make it through, um, I, I, I'll give you an example. Of, I had a kid, I uh, didn't want to match until his senior year. Um, and I, I really admired this kid. Came out for wrestling as a ninth grader. Never, not athletic. He was at practice every day. And he, and he worked really hard. He got killed every day and he kept on coming back. And to me, it was an amazing thing. Uh, he was not athletic. And, you know, we were putting him in JV because I, I loved the kid because of, you know, what he stood for and how he tried to get better. And, um, you know, finally he won his senior year. I was like, I was like, I was like this. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, but what, you know, what, what that, he came, he came back to Blair and saw the, um, the new coach there, Ross Homer, and he talked about his experience at Blair and how it, how it prepared him for life. Um, how he had a certain mental toughness of, of being able to get through things uh, and in, in, in being able to handle stressful things. It's, it is an amazing sport. Um, you know, probably not, you know, it's like boxing, it's like, um, you know, jujitsu, but, um, you know, the way that wrestlers train is pretty, pretty amazing. And, and it takes a certain kid to be able to do that, you know, every day or, you know, ever, ever, how many times you have, it, have to do it. Uh, and, and the one thing that I can see with, with college wrestlers, if they don't love it, yeah, forget it. Yes. Yeah, and that's so the biggest mistake I, we see talking to many, many college wrestlers, the biggest mistake they can make is cut weight that freshman year because mm -hmm. they're not ready. They got to get a lot better. Very few guys are in the hunt to be an All-American mm -hmm. national champ right away. Right. They need to acclimate to college being away from home for the first time. Academics, now wrestling with guys who, who are beating, he's got to beat in the room all the time, which they're not used to. They come in, they drop 10, 11 pounds. They're stressed out of their minds. We're like, wrestle what you weigh that year, especially that year. I think the value, I think as, as me as a coach, in order to protect myself and continue, you know, because you go through a lot of ups and downs yourself as a coach, with the successes that you have and, and the heartache that comes with some of these kids where you come up a little short um, is to understand that the value is in the journey you know mm -hmm. and that uh, to appreciate that process uh, i think as a younger coach you you're coaching guys and you don't you take for granted you don't really realize um what you're doing when you're doing it and as an older coach um the experience of let's say like him coaching rivera and day to day, hours and hours and hours putting it in. You, as much as it's work, you realize um, he it's, loves it's it special. Yeah. He know? loves it's it. It's special, you know? He loves to compete. It's the time you're putting in and you, re so there's a return on that time. And then the, the, the amount that you're actually at an event is minimal compared to the amount of hours that you spend yeah. training, you know? So it's like, uh, like you saying, both said, you know, training four, four years or five years to run nine seconds, you know, and, 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 and win a medal, but you're, it's the same thing is true at wrestling. So I think as, uh, if you can, as a coach, communicate that to your athlete, to your parents and get them to understand that, like, this is a special time in our lives, you know, that you're going through this sport and it has something special to offer. And, and he goes back to saying about being happy competing and, and being happy being so especially in today's world with people with um, mental health right and you're happy with who you are and how your life is and you can go out and compete from a uh, from that place in your heart you're going to have much more success than if you're at a very bad place and you're not and you're not happy with the way that you're doing things you know what i mean so it, that's part, as an older coach like i find myself trying to impart the wisdom that you've gained having been around for 40 you know plus years and i think he would probably agree with you you you, you can you can do things i couldn't do certain things Absolutely. when i was younger yeah. i i didn't know it when i was yeah. younger yeah. and like he's trying to tell these younger coaches come to me i'll, I'll show you i'll help you and they can't um so i had a guy like that you know, um 
I, I call them my mental health sessions. Uh, but when Pat Santoro was training, he would he would come to uh, Blair once a week and we'd wrestle. And it, to me, it was uh, soothing. Uh, he beat the snot out of me, but um, of talking technique, uh, getting in positions, um, and for me, it was. I'm at this place and I don't have anybody I can gain any knowledge with. He's trying to get knowledge from me and I'm trying to take knowledge from him. And I would say um, when you have that type of, um, of process, like I learn from kids all the time. Right, me too. Um, so yeah, it's, it, you know. All the time. So it's, it, you know, like somebody say, where'd you get that? As I had a 10th grader that showed me that. <laughs> you know, it's just, but well, it's, that, it's that ability to go back. What did you just do? And, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, developing your own style, your own, your own technique. But to me, that's what makes the, the sport so fun too. Of, um, one, developing that relationship of Pat Santoro feeling comfortable to come back and, and work out with me when he's trying to make a world team. Um, the, other, the other part of it is, um, and I think that's huge. Um, and, and, you know, to be a successful coach, you have to have good relationships with your athletes. Yes. Um, that's that's to me really really important. And I think you know going going back and for me remembering uh, all the coaches that I've ever had, and I would say there's not too many of them I had a bad relationship with. Um, it was always very positive, and um, they were guys that were trying to tr trying to make me better. Um, and I think those are the people that kind of made me the, the coach that I am. I had, you know, certain guys that um, uh, go, go to Carl Adams. Um, he's the one that made me systemize up everything that I was doing in wrestling because he had, he had that system and he was trying to teach that system. My system is very different than what his system is, but that's, that's how, um, you know. Um, you have a system. Yes. And then I had, a, you know, another guy that um, he was uh, all over the place uh, with his teaching and and his technique was Gary Barton, but I had an incredibly good relationship with him. Um, I wanted to wrestle him every every day. It was a, pretty hard because he was the head coach, but you know he was so tricky. Um, and you know at, at that time um, in the seventies, wrestling was changing so rapidly. Um, yeah, Rhode Island. Yes. Um, he coached for Billy John. Did he? Senior year high school at Clifton, before he went back to Pennsylvania. I didn't know that. Yes. What a great guy. Fantastic guy. That's why we went to the group. Yeah. What a great guy. He's a, I mean, I still see him at the NCAA tournament. But he's an old school clarion guy. Old school clarion. Yeah. Um, but I mean, old school clarion <coughs> had three national champions. Yes. I mean, that's crazy. Crazy. And, and you know, Wade, Wade Chalice was at the time, um, you know, the most, uh, you know, he, he would get in uh, what you would say were unsophisticated positions. He was way ahead of his time. Yeah, very innovative. And so- I spoke for two hours a few, week, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and he has a different way of thinking yeah, yeah. also, as yeah. you saw. Yeah. Um, incredibly good guy, you know, and, uh, and his approach and his approach to wrestling, and he was, um, I think, very well skilled of, above his time, but, you, you know, just even, you know, the simple things that he did, it doesn't even compare to what's happening now in wrestling. Mm. Um, but it takes, a, it takes a different set of, like I, find, like I find it interesting that I can look back at a film and I, you and I, I don't think we've talked about this, but like I can look back at a film that's 30 years old or 20 years old, right? And a film that I might have watched, you know, 200 times. And now um, at this age, see it through a whole different set of eyes mm -hmm. yes. and still learn from the same film. I did the and other I, day. I, right, and I'm looking at it and I'm saying to myself, <laughs> I go, why did how I, did I miss this that, all How did I not know How that? did I miss this all of these <coughs> I years? I did the same thing. And I'm saying to myself, this is unbelievable. And if I tell a younger coach that, they're like, we see, you know, they would say, we watch this film 500 <laughs> times. I'm still learning from the same film. Yeah. And, I, and I'm saying to myself, and I've seen it 200 times. Yeah. And, and uh, it just speaks to though, as you, um, I say so stupid. <laughs> well, as you as we get the better, experience, though, more the experience, insight you've that, seen right, more, the insight and that more hooks have. in your brain to, right, to yeah. pick up on that. You didn't have that hook yes. before that you. But might it's, have it's the mental side of it, like that, allows you 
to like it's what you bring to the video is going to affect what you take away from the video but right. it's the same thing like the whole the body if they're not connected and your body's not the mind's not there it's my brain that allows me to be able to see that you know what i'm saying if i if i shut off and i approach it with a different attitude i try to teach the kids like that same attitude it's like when you look at things when people show you things and you're around people who have are knowledgeable right he works with like we work with a lot of the same athletes and i hand them off to him and and over the years he's worked with we've worked with a lot of the same people and be like a sponge take that take that there, there's value there take that information you know but i don't i think in today's that's not common like with a lot of kids um they're taught to like circle the wagons um you know i go here i go there um they may have respect for like coach buxton or myself or somebody but nonetheless they're they're not set up to um continue to grow can be a life learner right. you know what i mean so like you would categorize they, they, us they, as a life learner yeah, you know yeah, yeah. they they go where the partners are right well that's always the case which is very yeah. interesting is that and i've always i would have said you know said this a long time ago they they come because there's partners there they don't come because coach buxton's there because i'm there they come because you have three state champions in your room or two or a national champion in your room or somebody else like that in your room, and that's what attracts the the individuals there, you know. And that's that hasn't changed. Um, that's been that way all along. But that goes back to um, it's the rare individual who's educated, who, like parent, who has that kind of insight to see and take advantage of. There's got to be something to why these guys that Coach Buxton worked with that are highly successful. There must be something <laughs> to it. He can't just be getting that lucky or having yeah. that many good partners. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I had I coached the. Uh, Brendan Ard and his father played for the New York Giants, you know, played like oh, for good. like 13 years professionally, yeah. whatever. And, and he, he, he brought his son to me and he said, you know, he basically, I, I, I jumped the gun on him the first time I met him. And I said, listen, I knew he was, I thought he was going to be like a pro athlete who thought he knew everything about athletics and, and how to approach handling a young kid. Like his, his son was young at the time. And in, instead it was exactly the opposite. And he basically was like, listen, I want to put him in this environment. I know he's got two left feet. He can't, he, he can't, you know, do this and do that. You've done the walk at the same time. But he goes, I know that if he's in, in this environment over time, he's going to get better. And um, I, I, I've done my homework. I see like the track record and I trust in the, in the process. And basically he handed him off and sort of got out of the way, right? And then his advice to other parents would be, when they would talk to him, he'd say, let, let them do their work. Like, and I, when he was coaching at, at high school level, you know, he gets a, a, an athlete, let Coach Buxton do his job. You know, he, he knows the process, he knows what to do. Good things will happen, don't <laughs> muddy up the waters, you know? So that's, that's that. For the and, most part. Right. Yeah, for the most yeah, yeah. That, it's good advice, but that's hard. But you know, for most parents in today's in today's world, um, for whatever the reason, whatever their background, they they meddle in, in the in the in the soup, you know, yeah. and then it, it affects the outfit. What they don't understand is how it impacts. They don't understand the the role that they play in the development of their kid from a mental standpoint. And yeah. for me personally, like I, they play the biggest and greatest role. You know, so it, I think like, although like you guys are working on the, dealing with the athlete and the other part. Do coaches work with you? No. Why? Do the parents, like that. Do parents work with you? We have a few parents that are in the program. The, the, the coaches, they work with us in that. They're, they watch us in the Zoom calls. Uh -huh. But no, I don't think most of them are nearly as dialed in as much as they feel like this is for the kids and I'm just like. Everything that you say, yeah. a good coach should be saying to their kids. Everything, would, everything that you said. Yeah, and the parents to their kids. Yes. Yeah. It's not enough parents. The parents I us. say my advice to parents is often, they're like, what can I do to help my kid, you know? And I, well, I say to them, you need to work on yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> they need to work on themselves. Because they, they yeah. can't... They, that blows they, my mind, by the way, that coaches aren't working with them. I, do you have a program for coaches? We've tried, we've talked to coaches about it. Like we've, we've mm -hmm. worked, but then, you know, that's usually not what the, and the same thing with parents. Like we know that if, if the parents worked with us, we could have a huge yes. impact. Yes. Huge. But the parent, it's it's just easier to, you yes. work with our kids. Yes. So it's just, instead of fighting that narrative,
Like I said, the narrative is very powerful. Once they have that in their head, it's like work with my kids. But so. if you look at the, it, when you, yeah. if you do the math, like for the parents watching and anyone who's listening or whatever, and they say, and you do the math and say, all right, what's the common denominator between why all of these people have been successful? And you start to look at study successful athletes in this sport, you'll see, you know, like I, I would do it. I, as a young coach, I would study the parents, right? I know it sounds crazy, but I would study the parents because I didn't have kids at the time, right? And I, I'm, I would study the parents and I would see like a, like how, like an example is like Donnie's father, right? I would study like how he, his demeanor, how he handled Donnie, how he, the things he do, Ard's another one, right? He deliberately didn't give his kid like Xbox, uh, buy him a quad, uh -huh. buy him this, buy him that, give him this, give him that. He had him in the, in the you know lifting weights and doing other things for his entertainment. He gradually gave him other things, but he he was he was it's very smart about how he went about it, and and it was it was thought out. It wasn't arbitrary, right? And and you start to see kids that are successful. They come from homes that are where the parents are like this, you know, and then the, what is like this. And you see there's a common denominator. You know, you start to see there, there's, a, there's a little bit. Now, sometimes it's always not good, mm -hmm. right? Because there are, like, the athletes may not say they're horror stories, but the public would say that's like, wow, this kid really had a rough upbringing, and he was successful in spite of that. And I know athletes who have achieved, like, at the Olympic level, mm -hmm. who would tell you, my mother was a driving force, my father was a driving force. Because of they were, my life was challenging, I was able, this made me the man I am, this made me successful. So those stories exist. That's also, that, that's goodness of fit. That kid's personality and that parent yeah, who's yes. a driver worked like yes. that. You do that yes. most people, right. they can turn away. Right, but I think they, I think that they, like the parents should learn from, just like athletes learn from other athletes. Young athletes, model, they look at Yanni, they look at Vito, they look at our Dake, they look at Taylor, they look at Burroughs, and they say these, are, they emulate what they see and things that they do. And our parents need to learn that they can emulate other parents who've had experience and they can learn from the parents. Coaches can learn from and be mentored by other older coaches. So I, I think like in, when I first started, my parents having had four boys who wrestled and had gone through it and competed at, you know, at different levels could in a sense mentor other parents and say, and share advice, right? And say, listen, when my son was this age or that age, I went through this and that. You don't need to worry about that. When they're worrying about it, they don't need to worry about it and give them advice and kind of help them along the way. But that's something that like, like you'll see there's a common, there is a commonality between these, high, these highly successful athletes and the, and, the, and the families or the support systems that they have around them. You know, the, the support systems that they have, yeah. the kids have around them, contribute immensely to the success of the athlete. That's what it's like you want to, most, most wrestlers, they have a real good wrestler, they have a parent that's, that's pushing, but they won't push too hard. So it's like knowing where is that, right. that line. line. Yes. And with my master's degree, he decided to do a study on wrestling, perfectionism and anxiety in wrestlers, and two of the six subscales of perfectionism dealt with parents, perceived parental criticism and perceived parental expectations. If those were high, the anxiety was high, the performance was low. Right. And again, that's for most people, because right. you can right. see it go the other way too for some yes. people. Yeah, yeah. But for most people, most of the yeah. time, it really matters. So you want to push, but yes. you want to make sure also you're hands off and trusting yeah. the environment. Yeah, yeah. I look at it like, okay, you have the athlete, and you have the influence, huge influence from the parent, huge influence from the coach. When you have athlete, coach, parent on the same page, yes. that's, that's, you know, yes. not ideal. Yes. But I mean, it's, because of wrestling starts at such a young age, um, a lot of the parents are the driving force right. and they continue to be the driving force. Right. So it's, uh, you know, I just remember talking to a kid, I go, what's the matter? He just pointed at his dad. <laughs> how, do you, how do you prevent burnout it's with these sad. little kids? Cause they sad. start, they do so much from such a young age. Do you worry about it with your guys frequently? All the time. Yeah. All the time. So I had, a I had a conversation with uh, a parent last week and asked him how many matches his, his kids will have throughout the entire year. Over 100. At what age? Uh, 12 and 10. So I, my, my answer is the opposite. I don't worry about it at all. So I, I, I don't, I gave up trying to 
worrying about what I can't control. And I know that the parent, I know the parent who's doing a hundred matches, like I, I can't get him to listen to me. He's going to do the hundred matches. So the parent, I, I don't have the time in my life to be able to educate all the parents. So I choose to spend my time and energy on the people who will listen a little more. And that I think this guy will listen to me. You do? I do think he'll listen to me. Um, he's very excited about yeah. what his kids are doing and they're doing a good job and they, they love wrestling. Yeah. Um, they, they love coming to the club. They, they, they come early so they can play. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of cool to watch yeah. that, um, like they thought I was all mad that it was, uh, five 30 and they were still playing. I go keep playing. But I would say, I would say this, it's a weird answer, but I would say like, I don't, if, if I have a say in what's going on and I'm part of the process, I don't worry about the kid getting burnt out because it's not going to happen on my watch. I think for, I think it, when I don't have control of some of the variables, <coughs> then it can definitely happen. You know what I mean? But when I'm in control, most, I'm not intense enough for most people. So for most people, I'm way, they expect that I'm wearing like the flat bill hat, like the Marine and I'm yelling and telling them to do push-ups and sprints and everything else. And I'm not that way. So I've managed to be successful or whatever that means, um, you know, being who I am and how I am. And it's not conventional. I would agree with that with Ernie. And he has a, a good temperament um, and, uh, and he's and he's thinking all the time of, of this is a process and not putting a lot of pressure on that particular kid even though he's getting it from from the outside I, you know it, um, he has way more patience than me uh, but you can only be who you are you know yeah. so I learned like I couldn't be you know how my father was um, like Glenn Pritzloff cannot be how his father was. So he's a product. Wow, that's so or, or Don, yeah, well, Donnie, the same thing. So what? You no, see, I'm not going to talk about it. But you see these athletes. So like, even, and they even got like, eat <laughs> <laughs> But you can take, you can take these athletes and you can take, you can, you can see that they can't, you can't be your father. You know what I mean? So like what Glenn said to me once, he says, uh, you know, he looked back at his childhood and, and how he, the success that he had along the way and he was a product of that environment, mm -hmm. but he could, he, he said, my kid is not going to be me because I cannot be my father. Yeah. And it's a hundred percent true, you know? So I, I think like to the extent that you like, you know, it, it can't happen with just the coach. It, it, it has to happen by, like I said, a support group around, around, around the athlete that nurtures the athlete. And if the parents are, are an integral part of that process, and I think like to the burnout question is like, if the parents are on board and everybody's working together in the best interests of the kid and they truly support, um, support that, um, I think it's less likely to happen when you have people that are, I don't know if educated is right, working. Well, you're informed, aware of it, yeah. but working together. Working together, like, yes. You need to take a month off. Yes, and, yes. And that, that. And he would say, get out of here. If they came back, he yes. would say, get out of here. Yeah. You know, he would say, you need it. I told you to take a month and he wouldn't let them back. So I you mean, know, and I would too. I would or, say this, I got kids that right now that are off after the state tournament so and they're not back. I had this one kid whose father pushed him really hard and made him successful because he pushed him so hard. Um, but sometimes he would come into club and it was his fourth workout. And I just, I go like this, go home. And he, he goes, he turned and looked at his dad and his dad's looking at me going like this, go home. And he goes, I got to go out and deal with that guy. And I said, you want me to go talk to him? He goes, no, because he knows it's going to get ugly. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the dad comes out. We got all these good partners for him today. He's tired. He's not going to accomplish anything. All you're teaching him is bad um, repetitions right now. You're teaching him uh, to practice poorly because he's so tired. I, I said, I want him to practice really well. I want him to train really hard. I, I want him to be excited about it. He's dead tired. Take him home. But see, this is a thing where like, like a young coach who's not as smart would say like, you well, know, first he's back down to the father. What, well, what's the objective? He wants to have a good practice and they work on skill work. They're trying to develop as a wrestler, as an athlete. And now the kid, you know, a, another example, he just had a good, he had just lifted really hard. His legs are trembling, his arms are trembling, and he can't do anything. And it's like it's like saying, okay, 
I'm, I'm going to go in for heart surgery and I'm going to get a triple bypass. And I want the surgeon to go like with the exact evidence and do it and do it, you know, and blow out all his muscle groups. And he's trying to do surgery on me and he can't get no fine motor skills. It doesn't make any sense. But yet the coaches will, will, um, will do like a, in a, a ton of conditioning or something prior to skill work. Oh. And, and and the the order of the sequence of what they do with the approach is not logical in the sense that they don't the objective it, they're missing the objective, you know, or maybe they don't think about it. I don't even know. But the, like if they th if they thought about it and they they're going to come in and ask the kids to do That'll skill work, to right? And it doesn't matter whether it's a 15 mile run or you're running up and down the stadium steps or going up and down the steps on your hands and then turn around. And I understand there's value in doing in working skills when you're tired. But then that becomes the objective. Like Coach Buxton said, I'm going to get the kid exhausted. I'm going to throw fresh bodies at him. That's the objective. Yeah. But when the objective is I need him to be controlling his body and, and be aware where he is in, 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 in the skills that he's doing, then you want his body, his muscles to be you know, That That causes you know. burnout. That, that causes <laughs> yeah. burnout. Add that to the list. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, I don't like the word burnout. I don't use the word burnout. Um, I, I would say that some people overtrain, and if, you know if you're tired, you can't do something efficient. So it's. But you make you make you make practice fun. I try to make you, practice, you make as, practice fun, as, fun, as fun as possible. You know, I try to make. He makes practice fun. Uh, I try to make my practice fun. I try. And I try he cracks to. himself up, and I you know I've seen him coaching and been in the room, and it's entertaining. And <laughs> and if you're if you're a, a, a if you're a wrestling guy. You enjoy the practice. It's, yeah. it's practice. You enjoy going there. You know, you enjoy. I have like, fun in practice. You know, right. He has fun in practice. <laughs> I have a lot of fun. And you have to when you're putting in four to eight hours right. a day. I mean, what are you going to do? Yeah. But I have a lot of fun in yeah. practice. Right. And yeah. part of that is communicating with people. Who you're working yes, with. And, 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 ha guys. and having fun with them. And, Chemistry. Yeah. We, we talk to a lot of these guys. So it's like Gene and I probably admittingly worry about burnout more than we probably should. <laughs> I would say I'm, it's probably more of something on my mind because of our profession. Yeah. So that's something that, you know, I look at for me as a parent. I'm like, maybe I'm not pushing the kid enough, you know, at their age. So it's like one of those things where, you know, you, we, we just see it all the time. And I would say there might even be more wrestlers in college that are like this in terms of their passion than like that. But I think ultimately, like, to remind yourself that you're, the mistake that people make is they're competing against everybody else. So you keep measuring yourself against everybody else and what society is doing, what little Johnny's doing, who's seven years old and he can bench press 150 pounds. It's my right? And then, you know, where he can, that's Johnny. He can do that. That's his level. <laughs> Minus the bench. That's his level. Right. Uh, uh, so then what happens that's is you, that's, yeah. the, that's the trap that you fall into as a parent. It's a natural, it's a natural thing given where we live in, the world we live in. So you have to stop yourself, pause, take a deep breath and say, Are you having fun? Yeah. Yeah. Are you and you know, what, what who are you, who are you competing against? Yeah. So my son is like, uh, you know, the, this guy has a mustache and he's in the seventh grade and this guy and this guy right, you know happens. my son is looks like like baby you and, yeah, yeah. and and he can't yeah, he can't yeah. compete with this other guy you know hormonally it's just doesn't <laughs> it doesn't equate so he can't he's in a fighting an uphill battle but recognizing that okay in three years that playing field will level right. and so you're trying to measure your son against somebody who's basically on steroids in, in a sense <laughs> right exactly. in a hormonal yeah, yeah or, testosterone or he could be on different. HGH. Yeah, it doesn't equate yeah, we're both you know what i mean right so you're saying it's the same thing or even like in today's world you know, certain states, and, uh, and I don't know yeah. all the rules, but you could have a kid old. who's 19 years old, <laughs> and he's competing, and 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 your boy is 15. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. or in some of these events, it's not. So I think it's all like the mistake Chet, that we fall into is that we we always compare ourselves to the Joneses, yeah. and I think then you, as a result, you you met you 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 set yourself up for a you know trouble. You know, I think if you don't do that, and I know as a parent, it's very tough. But I think, um, you know, when you're around like-minded people and you, everybody has their, their moments, I think, like, like he said, he called me up, I call him up, you know, and I ask him, we, we pick each other's brain and, and it's, it's important to have people like that around you. you know Absolutely. I mean? yeah. You know, but you know, the, the, I don't think people enjoy the process enough because there's so much emphasis putting on, on winning. winning and losing. Yeah, I agree 100%. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, in, in working with, I don't care what the level is, is about trusting yourself 
and knowing that you did everything you could do to put yourself in this situation. And that's, that's all you have to, that's all that really matters. Um, and to trust, trust yourself that you're there and, and try to do the best that you can do. And if, you know, you lose, you lose, you win, you win. But it's, uh, you know, I think going out and, and trying to let it fly a little bit more and having that, that attitude, um, and this might be a wrong approach, but I've tried to talk to guys about entertaining more. And what's entertainment in wrestling? Scoring, Action, scoring points. Scoring points. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. scoring points. I said, do you think people want to come to Rutgers and watch two guys stand around? They want to see people wrestle. But I think, Buck, it's an interesting concept so, to speak kind of to that point is like the younger me would have, would have had the kids more in, you saw the competition as more of a fight mode, a fight mentality, yes. a fight brain. And then the older I, me- I believe in that too. Yes. You've got to fight. Yes, but but the play, the to make it a game, like now you hear like Sanderson talking about making it a, a game, it's a game. He refers to it as a game. Mm -hmm. It's a good game, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's purposeful language that he's using. Absolutely. Right, so that- That's so, kale all the way. Yes, because he's, it's, you, you liken it to like, I, I give some of my guys an example saying it's like a video game, something they can relate to, mm -hmm. where you're you know, you're playing the game and you're trying to find a way to navigate and come back and win if you're down or win the game. Um, the same thing the way you would navigate a wrestling match. So they we tend to think there was an era like maybe the Gable era, and I, I may be wrong about this, but they like where um, you know, at least it was my perception being younger was that you're you know the place that people would go mentally before um, a match was more in a, a, a fight mentality. Absolutely. But then you deal with like having Lee <coughs> Kemp around, mm -hmm. right? He was, when he was in Jersey, you know the mm -hmm. whole story. And and talking to him and he's just an ultra mellow guy, mm -hmm. right? And everything is internal, it's in here. And he's not listening to ACDC banging his head against the wall before he's gonna go out and compete. He's, he, I don't know what he's listening he's to. He's a he different cat to, He's a different cat. But he, but he, but, but there's, I'm saying there's, something to be learned from that approach Absolutely. even schultz himself Absolutely. was was much more internal yes. so you you as coaches we all have to pick and choose who are i don't know if mentors are the right word who our role models are who who do we hold up as a role model for kids like who did who does coach buxton want his kids to emulate who is a good example of this mm -hmm. who's a good example and every, of that. everyone's different everyone's different temperaments but the people who you choose i think are important because like um that's what makes coaching so unique you know is that there's it's like teaching there's an art side to coaching and there's a science side to coaching mm -hmm. so to be successful you have to be pretty good at both Right, so you need to know your X's and your O's, and you need sometimes to know. Sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't. Right, and, but you have the art side of it. Mm -hmm. Can is is what, and what, um, and what you do with one kid, you do different. You with do another different kid. with another kid. I mean, you you yeah. you probably see the same thing. Um, everybody has a different mindset, and so and trying to 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 deal with that is, I think, for me, that was the hardest thing as a coach, to to get somebody on the same page as where I was. And you know, why does this kid fail in a situation that he should win in? You know, those are the those are the things that I struggled the most with. Um, uh, anxiety is another one, um, and uh, you know, Kellen Russell, as a tenth grader, was struggling a little bit um, just just with himself growing up, and uh, I sent him to a guy, and they. Um, he really did a really good job with him, but from that point on, because uh, he was uh, a little bit, he trusted himself more, he was calmer, um, but he would fight really hard when he wrestled. His wrestling skyrocketed, um, and you know, he, he won just about everything in high school, he's two-time NCAA champ, um, but to this day, uh, if he didn't go through that, it would have been a different direction. Yes, that's what, but that's the, I had this conversation with an athlete at the state tournament this year. And um, I said, I, I, I was telling him, 
um, and I, I'm going to get the year wrong, so these guys watch this so they can yell at me, but um, Joe Dubuque was wrestling Matt Valenti, right? And I, I think it was their sophomore year. And um, they were both training with me, and I knew I seen them compete in the room every day, so I knew how they competed head to head. And they went out and they had they had, they hit early in the tournament, and Joe ended up beating Matt. So no big deal. Joe was a tremendous wrestler. Matt's a tremendous wrestler, but I was really disappointed in the way that Matt competed. You know, and he was at a point in his career as a young sophomore where I felt like. You know, here he is, he, 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 you know, he went out basically laid an egg and didn't wrestle well up to his full potential. At least that was my perception of it. So I had a long conversation with him after the match and, and I told him, I said, I'm not disappointed that you lost. And losing to Joe is no, is, you know, the, he, that's not, a, you know, any embarrassment, but you're capable of competing at, at a higher level. And he, what people don't understand is that even athletes like like you know Valenti went on to be a two-time NCAA champion and two-time state champion he he was at a crossroads at that moment so like when you're talking mm -hmm. about about Kellen Kellen it's the same exact type of story where mm -hmm. people don't understand kid people who are highly successful right they're off even uh, Marcel's like an example mm -hmm. right they go through they go through things in their life and there and there's periods where they're at, faced with adversity and they and and they, they're at junctions where they can go left or they can go right. And like he said, he could have easily gone this way and not had the career that he <coughs> went, had to go on and become two-time NCAA champion. Instead, and Valenti very similar, he, if, had he not <coughs> responded the way he did, had it wasn't handled the right way, the, and that's what people need to understand, parents and coaches need to understand. If these moments, these teachable moments are not handled, that's why it's important to be there sometimes. Uh -huh. And I used to always envy him having the opportunity I would say to like my parents, people don't wouldn't listen to me. A lot of people will listen to me, but I would say like I didn't have anybody to talk to. That's why I would talk to him. But he, you know, he he's able to be mad side with these kids. They're learning on the job. They're learning in the match. There's no better teaching time than when they're competing. So they he's coaching a his team, and they're as they're interacting with the kids, and he's grabbing them right after the match, and it's extremely valuable time. So in my case, I was never able to be in the corner. So I tried to be around so that when they lost, I could. That's a hard thing. I could be yeah. there for That's them. A hard thing. You know, I could teach them how to lose. A lot of coaches don't do it. You understand? I, I, know, I realized the value in Talk those moments. Talk to them moments. after a loss or, right. in a, or in a critical moment. Just Both. Either, either one. Either one. But Some, I, like, sometimes you gotta whoop, whoop the horse, right? To get them in the run. And other times you gotta you gotta do this. Like Dave lost in the, in the state finals. That whatever match you lose, being there to help him to make sense of that situation, right, um, is important. It's critical in their development because they could go this way and not go that way. Like Joe lost in, in Fargo, right? And I asked Donnie to go talk to Joe, and Donnie had lost in Fargo, right? <laughs> And here you got Donnie Pritzloff talking to to a guy who's going to end up going to Rutgers, right? But he had and he was disappointed in that he 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 just basically he was a little late for the weight and he he petered out and the size started to matter later into the tournament. He's one match away from placing and Donnie's talking to him and and here you have a guy who's a world champion talking to you, telling you know and giving you advice and say, look, I've been here, I've been there. But those moments send you in this direction or send you in that direction and, and, and you know being supportive is is huge yes um, it's huge but there are there are times like i'm saying to myself what do i gotta do to for this kid at this at this moment um and you know what you guys do uh, you do it every day but there's sometimes you hit and there's sometimes you miss and, uh, you know that that was that to me but that you, was the hardest thing you understand like we something you and I do. I know. I don't know. You know. I could speak to me when I was younger, like how a kid would do something really, you know, stupid or make a big mistake, and it. I had to learn as a coach how to control myself and how to how to act and how to show him how to feel about that mistake that he made and set the right example. So if I 
made it into a bigger deal than it was. And I threw my hands up in the air and I carried on. I tried and to I was that. sending the wrong message, you know? Okay. And I learned early on that I had to, like, I had to work, I talked about parents working Work on themselves. themselves. I had to work on myself. Yeah. I worked on myself hard over the years to become yeah. the coach that I am. So that doesn't come without a lot of put me putting in time working on myself, not just the athlete. So how you react, or I, I was reflect on my behavior. How did I handle that situation? I didn't handle that well. I need to handle that better. My reaction at the moment to his doing that was, was wrong. And the right you know. time to talk. Right. That is huge, you know. And I, I usually lay that on the athlete. Can we talk now or you want to talk later? That's good. You ask them. I ask them. Yeah. That's one of the things we have in our coaching mindset series, asking the athlete, when did they want the feedback? Mm -hmm. Immediately, later, Monday. But that has a big impact. Some people, you could tell it right away. Some people, um, most, they're not going to listen. Most want right away. Yeah. Uh, but they're so upset that all you're going to do is make the situation worse. Um, but, you know, that's... That's also the relationship too, you know, like, you know, you know, Coop always brings one back to me. He lost to a kid from Shemokin and I just said to him, you got smoked by Shemokin. <laughs> it seems it, like that worked for his personality. But it, 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 it did. See? It did. Right. Um, it, you know, it's, um, you know, and those. It, yeah, but it was your way of telling him, you're making light of the situation saying, Yes. It's no big deal that you yes. lost. We yep. need to do yep. some work. We yep. can get back in there and yep. we can but take they, care of yep. the, the kids who work with me, they know, know. They know I'm about development. Yes. Right. Yes. And so you're looking long term, not just that yes. one match. Yeah. Even with the Padre. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, our, our, our brother, who you, who you help, and it's like, you don't need, it's like, obviously, he's not competing anymore, yeah. but still putting the time in just yes. because, just being a coach. Well, that's, that speaks to being a vocation and not just a job, yeah. right? Because yeah. uh, I was going to say the same thing. Father Greg comes to my house and he's like, look what Coach Buxton showed me. I'm like, why is he showing you anything? <laughs> I'm like, well, you teach my, kid, you teach my kids at least. You know why? Because he loves it. He does. He loves it. He does love it. He, I mean, he'd rather do that than... But that's like it's me and him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like me and him, even he, if we were He loves it. I'm trying to like, teach my own kids. Other. He's like, I want to wrestle. I don't need to learn. I don't need to... Even if I wasn't to show somebody else the skill set, like the process of learning this stuff... Uh, I like so I like to learn so I so like for me like if, if he if I share some with him he shares some with me I'm like oh wow you know it, and it's not always about like me having the ability to now impart that to you it's just that I gain some knowledge like I, I right. and it, and it, and it can help me to help others like I like uh, that's what I'm always looking to do is if I can understand more how people think understand more in and, and just keep working on your craft, you know, just keep on trying to get better at your craft. You're looking at the long game. That's what we're saying here, not the, not the immediate. Right. We're comparing to other people. Yeah, right. Well, even, out, even outside of the so, like, yep. State championships just happened. Yeah. All these little kids come back and have state champ. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Don't, I don't make a big deal out of it. Yeah, yeah. Great job, man. You know, the parents are, that's it. <laughs> That's it. That's all you got. I gave him a high five. <laughs> but it, you know, to me, I'm thinking about okay. It's it's good that you're at the high at the top of your field at this level. Right. But what do we need to do to get yeah your ways away? Yes. You know, it's <laughs> it's a big deal. It's not a big deal. Right. But, you know what I mean? It's you know perspective. You, yes. So you know, I remember talking to Mike Gray. And I, how many times a kid state champ was he? I think he was maybe one less than Shane, maybe the same as Shane, eight yeah. or nine. Yeah. But and then he they went every year. Then he wins. <laughs> then he won four state championships. That's pretty nice. And, and he said, <coughs> "I would trade all of those to be a national champ in college." Yes. I'm sure he would. I mean, it's it's just the level that you are at yes. that time, and you know he was the first four timer, I believe. Yes. First. Yeah. yeah. And um, huge deal. That's a big deal. Yes. In New Jersey. Yeah, it's a big deal. Huge big deal. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I think at the time he probably thought it was a big deal, but, you know, moving on, it's not that big of a deal. Right. And that's, you know, kind of, the, you know, I try to take the approach with younger kids in wrestling. It's but about you getting can't better. Change for you, being <laughs> where you've been to the top of the mountain, you can't go, you can't even make yourself um, feel the level of emotion, like elation that the parents feel. 
when you're at a kid's state event yeah. because because you're, well they say you're, to me how do you st how do you stay so calm? <coughs> you're, yeah well, I've seen all this <laughs> yeah I, there's only one time that I've shown any emotion yeah that was at the world championships when Sebastian turned the guys to yeah. go into the finals yeah that, that's the only time I've really shown any emotion like uh, the guy from Rock Fed, from Easton little short guy I've never seen that old man get so excited before. <laughs> Somebody better get the respirator out. <laughs> I was excited. Yeah. It was, yeah. I got that. I got that two years ago when I was coaching uh, Julia, uh -huh. and I'm coaching a girl's first girl I'm ever coaching, right? Yeah. And we're in Fargo, and she wins the. Um, I get. I get choked up. She wins the the blood match of medal, you know, and I got really excited. So people who were watching at home in New Jersey saw me, like, who knew me back in like the eighties, what? saw me get excited, <laughs> and they're like, "What the heck is going on with him?" And I was like, I couldn't control it, you know. Yeah. It's just, but it's just in you. you know? know. We're all waiting for Cal to crack too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that may happen. I mean, there's going to be possible. Yeah, that may happen. You know, you got ten champs. That might happen. Um, yeah. Uh, but like. You know, knowing, knowing the process and what this guy has gone through yeah. and to move up a level every year. Um, and, the, you know, the biggest part is if he loses that match, then he has to wrestle the bronze match. If he loses the bronze match, then he has to wrestle for fifth. It could be a long afternoon moving forward. You know, he made the process so much easier for himself. Um, but, you know, coming back to what I keep saying, he believed. Yeah. And so um, he, he believes that he's never out of any match. And freestyle, it can go either way. Yeah. You know, you, you get caught in a lace, boom, it's done. Um, you get caught, caught in a trap arm, you know, match could be over. So to try to avoid those situations and, and having the ability to scramble um, is, is, is really big in freestyle. Um, but I was, that's probably the most excited moment I've ever had in wrestling. It's nice. Yeah. Could be. What were you gonna say? Oh, I thought you were. Gonna... No, <laughs> a... no, yeah. It's um. It just co people connecting the dots, like building that athleticism, knowing the technique, having that will to win, that fighter spirit. Yet at the same time, you want to let go and let it fly, mm -hmm. and you know what you're gonna tell yourself in that moment. And also, like I said, you're you're practicing those situations, being sucked in on the leg. Mm -hmm. Okay. You could do all the lat pull downs, all the pull ups you want, but if you're not gonna actually have the will Hold to on. fight in that position, why lift all those weights? But being able to connect, okay, this is my cue in that moment, this is the technique, this is the lifting, bang, in that moment. It's like that's- Here's, here's how I try to teach it. All these things have to go in motion. Yeah. So like in that particular situation, your hands have to pull. Your head's gotta be up. If you're on the right side, your right knee's gotta slide in, you gotta get your left knee to pivot. You've got to be driving into the guys. If you don't make all those facets work together, you're going to have a hard time scoring against somebody that's really good. Which means you're going to have to drill that thousands of times. With, and you're going to under have a resistance. Yeah. And under you're probably going to have to have one or two words that's a cue that's going to encapsulate that entire feeling like that because they don't have time to have a long drawn out dialogue in their head. It's, you know, for younger kids, keep their face off the mat. When their face goes on the mat, they're going to lose. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, like, I teach to go with my jaw on the bicep so, you're, so yeah. your head doesn't go through the hole. You know, no matter if I'm on a double or if I'm on a high crotch, um, and getting your hands is locked is important. Um, but, you know, this is wrestling through positions. This is creating um, angles. And everybody thinks the, you know, the angle only happens from the shot. The angle still has to happen when you're down on your knees. You know, and one thing that I saw um, and watching the high school state tournament, um, kids don't use their hands very well. Um, uh, uh, do, do you feel the same way? Yeah, I always felt that way. Yeah, they, I, you know, I haven't. I but haven't, I'm not surprised at it because I don't think I, I don't think it's I don't think it's taught. I think what's taught is shots. You know, mm -hmm. that's what I saw. A space shoot, space shoot. Stand shoot. It's yes. not hand fight shoot. Yes. It's, space, it's you know stand shoot. But of, um, I didn't feel <coughs> that kids tried to get into controlling positions. So it, you know, like working to the inside, controlling a wrist, uh, being able to to move ahead. Um, and I, you know, maybe because I you're spoiled. I am definitely spoiled. Um, 
and I'm, I'm in a good world too. I yeah. mean, yeah. well, he's looking at a million hours of film, plus he's right there at world championships and stuff, and he's watching the best guys in the world, and then it's very tough on your brain to go and watch a. Uh, it's like watching slow motion wrestling when you're watching these younger kids yeah. and then they're not engaging in the same way, you know, so, so I mean, me and him were together at Fargo and we were talking about head position and just trying to create angles and exactly what he's talking about, get to a scoring hold, yet the kids are dancing around and they're not, they're not an, an initiating contact or trying to work toward that even as a goal, like they don't even have that as an objective, you know what I mean? But it's not... Um, there's not a lot of people out there, I think, that are... Um, so so much of wrestling is squeezing, you know, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be squeezing. You know, it's, it's taking, I think you should take advantage of a guy squeezes, creating space and snapping off or posting. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in a lot of ways. I travel a lot. I see the world, I see, you know, things that happen in the US, and then I see things that happen overseas. So it's, um, you know, watching senior level, the speed is so incredible. Um, you know, even at even at the Big Tens, um, it, it, you know, I don't know if the referees best, can best even the keep up yeah. with what's happening out on the mat. And there has to be review um, because the, the action is so athletic now and so fast. At the end of the day, though, for me, like. It, how I measure my success is not if the kid won. I want the kid to win. You know, obviously you want the kid to have success on the mat and win. But if I've prepared him, uh, if he comes up short, if I've prepared him for for life, like in, you know, for the for the getting punched in the gut and losing the match when you're winning by a lot of points and you get, something happens or the ref makes the mm. terrible call and you lose and your heart gets ripped out of you. Like, because of some of being on the losing side of those things, trying to insulate, I don't know the right word, but trying to protect my athletes from that trauma because there's grown men walking around here, you know, we all know them who are 50 years old, 60 years old, okay. who, kept, who took third in the state, mm -hmm. never got it done, and, and are bitter and angry about it, where they, they, they placed at NCAs and didn't do this or didn't do that, and they don't know how to process it. So part of like my journey, my part of my goals as a coach is to prepare my athletes so that when that blow comes and they inevitably get punched in the gut, that they're able to absorb that shot you know that impact that trauma and get back up and get back on the horse and get back in there and continue to move forward whether it's whether it's in the next arena in life and it's not on the matter whether it's on the mat it doesn't really matter but that's if i if i've done that um then i feel like i've been successful because the large majority of kids that we work with although we've both been very fortunate to work with extremely high level guys the large majority of those kids are going to go on to you know go to you penn work in a, you know financial markets or do different things but outside of wrestling become a doctor become a lawyer become this or become that or whatever they're doing and they're not going to be in the wrestling world coaching or, or competing so you know i i, I, would, I would back that up 100 percent. you know i think that wrestling like, can bring to you is pretty amazing this is where i wanted to end up with impact off the mat when we, when we spoke at the states i think you were a little distracted because I believe it was a, one of your female wrestlers just won and you were looking for the girl that she beat mm -hmm. and you said that it was your responsibility you felt like it was re your responsibility to talk to her and yes. prepare her for the future yes. did you did you get to talk to her what would you say i did, I did actually yeah well, you got her. what do you but say yeah, to those people I who went up to her so it, it, the girl who i was coaching won the semi-final match and the other guy lost the other girl lost and i went i wanted to find the athlete who who lost because oh. I admire her and I thought she, you know, that's a tough spot and my heart went out to her because she's, you know, she was seconds away from being in the finals and the match went our way and I've been on the other side of that and I know that, you know, I could have been very well, that could have been my athlete. So I wanted to go over to her and say, listen, you know, you need to come back and, and on the other side and you need to take the third here and tell her that, you know, that she wrestled a great match um, and just sort of be there for her to help her 
because I know I know too often this doesn't go on. You know what I mean? Like this doesn't happen, and the coaches aren't there afterwards to sort of pick up the pieces and they let the kids to their own to sort of figure it out. And to me, I think that's a little bit dangerous because I don't want to leave that them in that state of mind. I'm not leaving it to right. to chance. chance. You know, I'm going to make sure that they're controlling that Mom. their perception yeah. a little bit. You know, their mindset. So, so uh, I did find her. I did talk to her, and she actually was. Uh, she's a really good person so she actually said i want to go can i go if anyone was going to beat me i'm happy it was her i hope she goes on to win and has success can i would she mind if i went over and, and uh wished her luck before she competed in the finals and it was a great conversation but i, I you know you've been around other guys on the other side of the mat i know because we've talked about yeah. it who you admire and you know like that the one <laughs> the guy who uh who, me and him were, were walking around at, at in fargo on the floor and uh he works for Rudis now, and he was an athlete. And I said, he, you, you said, did you know him before? And I said, no, I didn't know him. And you said, how, I said, how do you know him? And you said, because Blair competed against uh, his team. He was on a team in Ohio, and he was really good. And you were telling me how good he was. I can't think of his name. But um, but you, you were telling me, literally, he, he was saying to me, we used to compete against this guy all the time, and this guy was a stud. And, and, and you know, I have a lot of respect for him and, and what he brought to the table when we competed against him. But I think that's true of all high-level athletes and high-level coaches. You respect, like me, I, my kids had to face his kids, he's had to face my kids, and I've always had nothing but tremendous respect for him and for his athletes. And it's, I, you know, it's mutual. You, I think you, all, like, that's just common in, in high-level sports. But I think young kids, if they're not mentored by good, good coaches and good people, they think that the other coach is their enemy and he's he's against me. You know what I mean, and and they need to be taught and 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 to say that he's not, he's just doing, he's just coaching the other guy the same way I'm coaching you. It's not personal and against you. He doesn't, he's not a bad person. He doesn't have any kind of harbor any ill will or bad feelings toward you. So he's you just, watch the Iowa documentaries. Yeah, <laughs> 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 show, though. yeah no, no, yeah, it's good TV. But but it's but you're you know a kid watching it, you're like, oh shoot. Yeah. yeah. So so Zach Ray and uh, uh, Travel the Lagnum wrestle each other I don't know how many times yeah. after they get done wrestling they would sit next to each other each other and talk about the match the whole time yeah. amazing yeah. amazing but they, they had a respect for each other they they grew a friendship as you know they were competing against each other but I you know I as two high-level guys yeah um, that's nice and I call it heavyweight mentality yeah. that's the way it's all heavyweights seem they seem a lot friendlier than they but I look at it as the highest level yes like when you get to that level of of um, I don't know if maturity is the right word <coughs> but a, a, a perspective of looking at it that way that is amazing it is amazing you know so what I mean Sebastian. but like that's why like I look at someone like Schultz what was amazing about he was an ambassador yes. to the sport for, for, the, world. Yes. for yeah. the world yeah. for the world for the world you know he's an ambassador yeah. to the sport and, and there's not many guys that you can say are ambassadors to the sport, yeah. you understand? So you, for, for those people who have that ability to, to uh, touch lives like, you know, internationally around the world, it's, a, it's an amazing thing, you know? And I think like if we can, that's what you try in, in our own little ways, if we can, if we can, and the people who we're in contact with, and we think that's what I try to do with like the athletes that are even, not even my guys, yeah. you know? But I think it, it, it's, it's important, you know. I think because if everybody does it, then it, every, it's the sport's a better sport. Better sport, you know, it's a better sport. And the coaches need to set the example by not acting like clowns. And and, uh, and 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 you know some of the behaviors that you see at some of these events, and the parents don't know any better. I understand that, but the coaches need to set the tone, you know, especially at these young kids' tournaments, because it becomes worse at the younger they are, and they get under, they need to understand that you know what the messaging is and what we're trying to what we're trying to promote, what you're trying to teach, what the lessons are, where the value is, you know? Which is, it, you know, it, it comes with age, but if the young people are smart enough to listen to some of these old, old, old guys, you know, I think they, it, it, it's important. You don't know anything, huh? It's important. <laughs> no, that's awesome stuff. Thank you, coaches, very much. Thank we gotta you. do this again. Thank we gotta, we gotta, we gotta talk, we can talk all day, I feel like. Excellent.
Hey guys, I hope you liked our interview with Coach Chef Buxton and Ernie Monaco. Uh, that was really one of the greatest masterminds I feel like in wrestling that, that I've seen, and I'm just I'm just happy to be part of it. That my brother Jeff and I were able to interview these guys, uh, not just on behalf of wrestling mindset, but on behalf of the entire wrestling community. Questions that everyone wants to know: What do these great coaches think? How do they feel? And what would they advise people? And, and these guys have over 70 years uh, wrestling experience if you put the two of them together. And again, some of the best people that ever came out of New Jersey and even in the whole darn country. So these people are experts. We will hear them out. And let us know if you'd like us to do it again. If you want me to have Coach Buxton and Coach Monaco on again or do other variants of this, please let me know because we could do it. I mean, we want to give the public, we want to give you what you want too. So again, it was just a great thing to be part of. Um, this is, so if you notice with the title, it's, it's the edited version because, well, as you'd imagine when, when best friends come together for over two hours, not everything is going to want to be aired. So a lot of things are kept between best friends. So we, we had to chop up some of the video, um, you know, where names weren't, I mean, again, they're, they're great guys. They didn't say, it wasn't like, you know, bashing people or talking bad. It's just, you know, some things are meant to be more in-house. So this is the edited version. Um, I know people asked, we're not releasing the unedited version. You know, we're not betraying anyone's trust here or anything like that. We would do that for you too. If you're on our show, if any of you are on our show and you ask us not to release something, we're obviously not going to do it. But let us know if you want us to do this again. Or, to, or, or who else you'd like us to interview. And if you'd like to see us to have Coach Monaco, Coach Buxton back, let us know. And any questions you might have to help um, direct the interview. This was much more uh, long form and free flowing, and we're planning on doing this a lot more. So I hope you like the information. Take notes. I'd recommend you take more notes than you think you need and watch the video over and over again. The first time you watch something, and this is, this is for me, the first time you watch it, put it on speed two. Well, you might not want to do that with my voice, but with other people. <laughs> Put it on speed too. For me, you might want to dial it down. <laughs> no, but for a lot of people, they don't talk that fast, not as high of energy. I'm not saying that's the guys in the shows, but a lot of times what I do is I'll listen to things on speed too the first time, power through and get and get like the main points right away. So now I have the information in my head and now it's marinating in my head. And then when I have more time, listen to it in regular speed. So that's a tip. You could do it how, however you wanted, wanted to do it, but there's just so much information out there. And I need to get all that information from out there into my head so I listen to things faster. You train yourself to listen and comprehend faster. And I think it also helps you to think faster. Like if you, if you hang around slow people, you're going to move slow. If you hang around fast people, you're going to get fast. And in, and in a world where, where speed matters and highly competitive society, you know, you need to be moving fast. You have to think fast. You have to sometimes speak fast. But then there's also a time to slow down. So please let us know um, if you'd like us to do it again. And thank you. I hope you enjoyed the show. And we'll see you again soon. Mindset makes the difference.